great child. My mother decided Debbie, who needed a little bit of help, would come live with us. Hell no, I said, being the compassionate, empathetic teenage girl I was. See, you know, I've got to understand, my sister, we always shared a room. I just got rid of her. We got married. I had a room for myself. I was sitting pretty. Two weeks later, mother brings Debbie. Hell no! See, I knew how to say no from an early age. No! Oh, no! But my mother, being my mother, never listened to me. I don't know why, so she never listened. Debbie comes home. <laughs> Debbie looks scary. Debbie's about a year, a year, year and a half younger than I am. And she's got way too much makeup. Her clothes don't fit. She's filling out breast wise and belly wise, and it's up to her, her butt. And I'm like, oh, hell no. <laughs> and my mother's only rules were. I'm going to be over Debbie at school, and then at night, you're going to help socialize Debbie and introduce her to your friends and take her out and do fun things with her. To the answer, no! Well, again, and my mother said, and by the way, she's, she's staying in your room. So, I introduced Debbie to the room, not very nicely, and thank goodness a lot of people with disabilities do not understand body language, correct? Who is good? Come on, Debbie! Let's go to the room! First night, say goodnight, Debbie. Turn off the light, she flips the lights on. I turn the lights off, she puts them on. We do we play this game two or three times. I yell at my mother. <laughs> She's like, my mother's famous word is Stacy, deal with it. I learned how to deal with it from about 12 or 13 on. Critical thinking, problem solving, what are my specialties? One thing I look for in educators, deal with it. Problem solve, critical think, figure it out. Let me guide you. But you need to understand, in the field of disability, things pop up and things change like that. And you have to go with it. So anyway, so we're playing this lights on, lights off game. I don't know, at, at 14, I don't know why the hell she's doing this. All I know is it's irritating the hell out of me. Everything she does is irritating me. And since the world rotates around me, I don't understand what's going on. So, knowing that I can problem solve this better than Debbie, but no problem. So we played this game. We slept with the lights on that first night. The next night, she flipped the switch all she wanted and the lights never went on. Hot damn. You know what? You can flip switches all you want when you take light bulbs out. Woohoo! I know how to problem solve this little area. Debbie didn't know how to shower. Debbie didn't know how to dress. Debbie didn't know how to hold hands. Debbie didn't know a hell of a lot of things. And at 13, I was figuring she should know all this stuff. She had lived in multiple foster homes. And the history that I learned was Debbie did live in a closet for the first seven years because her mother was paranoid schizophrenic. Schizophrenic. When she'd go off of her meds, things went bad, and she went into foster care. My mother, being a director of special ed, came into contact with all of this. And Debbie was the next placement she was going to get was Judy, because Debbie had a tendency, anger issue, aggression, sexualized issues. Now, being 14, I didn't know any of, any of this stuff. And my mother didn't understand all of this stuff, too. She didn't have the history. Because for some reason, that kind of stuff is kind of kept out of the collateral. It's hard to place people when you have all this stuff back then. I learned to read between the lines. I know what inappropriate behavior means. 
when it comes to mothers. I know inappropriate comments means when it comes to my guests. And I flush it out, get it verbally, and I know what's not written. So Jenny was having all of these issues. The problem was, we didn't know what the heck was going on. Daddy seemed fine, and he would take her for the weekends and have weekend visits. Well, about six months into placement with psychological assistance, we found out what was happening. Daddy was having an incestuous relationship with his daughter and had been for years. Okay. So being 14, all I knew is Debbie was a mess. And my mother wanted me to introduce her to my friends. And she would come at people, legs out, grab and oh yeah, they I like a look. I hate cameras. Anyway, so this was the kind of thing that I was seeing and not knowing what was going on except for, oh my God, I'm not introducing her to anybody who I know. She was going to embarrass me. And she did multiple times. And I'd pull her back and say, if you can't read people correctly and I'm gonna show you how and do this, you're staying home, I don't care. I don't know. My mother, no, I don't know. Debbie learned. Debbie learned to dress when she had correct fitting clothing. Debbie learned to wear makeup correctly, do her hair, brush her hair, read people, interact, and not embarrass the hell out of me. At 14, that's all I cared about. But Debbie learned this. So after about nine, 10 months of this, my mother found a great placement, a great home for Debbie. And so Debbie went. By that time, Debbie and I were pretty much sisters. I was used to Debbie. Debbie was used to me. We joke around. We pal around. We do things. When she left, I kind of felt like when my older sister left. You know, I'm glad she was gone. But and I would go see Debbie, and we'd hang out on a weekend day or whatever. And then the courts did what courts do, and I understand it. Courts reunified because mom went back on her meds, dad wanted to have visits again, and things went downhill. Mom went off of her meds, told Debbie that her foster mom was going to kill her and she needed to kill her first. And you know how easily our guys are manipulated. So Debbie went to her foster home, mom with a book or not. Also, mom said, I can't deal with this. And that was the last placement that Debbie could have when she ended up in an institution. Now, one thing that I'm leaving out is that Debbie also had a seizure disorder. Looking back, Debbie had, um, she was hard of hearing. She probably had mild cognitive delays and she had a seizure disorder and you know all the trauma and everything from you know probably post-traumatic stress syndrome due to all of the abuse and everything then we went to the institution Camarillo when it was still open she had an aggressive episode he was tied down to the bed. He aspirated on her meds and died. All of this happened before I was 16. At that point, I told my mom, no more. Oh, give a damn. I will, I will leave home before you bring another person into this house. I'm done. I want nothing to do with this population. Because I had gone to all of our special schools and done the special program and, and worked in the classroom as, as a peer role model and you know, we didn't call back then, but all of those kinds of things. I was embedded in the system. And all I knew is it was hell. 
And at 16, 16 and a half, it reaffirmed it to me. And there was no way in hell I was going to work in this field. So when I did the career testing and this field came up, I'm like, oh, hell no, I ain't doing that. But the second thing was nursing. I looked into nursing. Nurses are control freaks. You can come into our hospital. We'll give you a bill, right? Sure. But if you don't take your bath the way we want you to and you don't eat when we tell you to, if we don't do this and you don't do that, you walk out or we ain't working with you. Awesome. I like that. I even went a step further and worked intensive care. I worked medical intensive care. Drug addicts. Alcoholics. Diabetics. Gangs. Those were my specialties. Suicide. Awesome. They already tried to kill themselves. What can I do? Only help them. And on top of that, we intubated them. What's that mean? Two kill yourself. You don't talk. Awesome. Perfect. Perfect for a control freak. And I said, this is wonderful. And the wonderful things with studies regarding ICU and intensive care, patients don't remember. <laughs> they don't remember the first week or so, if they are in critical shape, they don't remember intensive care. It's seamless. Perfect. Problem power professional. It was great. So I became an intensive care nurse. I went through a specialized program. I was sought after. I knew I was good. I could go anywhere in this country. However, one day at my county hospital, and where I worked was UC Davis. My husband went to med school there. I knew him before med school, so don't even worry about it. Um, <laughs> Uh, um, but he, we came up here for med school, and that's where I did my nursing, my RN training. I was already a nurse in LVN down in San Diego, or not San Diego, but in LA. Came up here, finished my RN, and went to UC Davis. That was my hospital. But you know, everything rotates around me. I discovered that with autism. There is this. You know, you just forget. Perfect. So, it was my hospital, and I loved it. It was crazier than crazy. We get Folsom prisoners in. I, I have the president, of, the president of the hospital, his mother came in. I worked with all these people. It was wonderful. Until one day, a young woman came in. She had a developmental disability, and she had been raped, severely, being raped. And was brutalized and torn up in her vaginal and anal canal. Now, the report I got from ER, because I don't work ER, because it's too crazy down here. You don't have as much control in ER as you do in intensive care. They kind of wipe you down, clean you up, medicate you, and then ship you up. <laughs> we tube you, and then we deal with you. Love it. The report I got from my peers was I got a retard down here. <clears throat> she's spitting, she's biting, she's climbing, so we had to tie her down. We drugged her, and oh, by the way, she was raped. <sighs> For some reason, that set me off. I don't know why. There's a lot of things that set me off. But I haven't been set off for quite a while. And all the memories came back from Debbie. Mm -hmm. And I was pissed. Because I couldn't do anything at 14, 15, 16. But now, I'm a nurse. As my students say, an RN real nurse, yep, that's it. I don't wear a hat, don't wear a dress. But yeah, that RN stands for real nurse, whatever that is. And I could do something. Within about 20 minutes, I had this girl at 
high, stick the rotation off, and we stand and talk. And I knew right then and there, my peers didn't understand what was there in front of them. I knew, as a society, what we had done for people with disabilities. And I knew sexuality doesn't scare me at all. I also knew disabilities doesn't scare me at all. I have no problem with people with disabilities. And I also knew I had one the ability to say no, and I was cocky enough and obnoxious enough that power folk don't intimidate me. I don't give a damn if you're a superior court judge that dealt with that before, to lawyers, to regional centers, to school districts, it doesn't matter. Because my mission is regarding sexuality, people being safe, and relating in their community. And you can't do that by always being safe. So someone's got to yell and bitch and mom and be obnoxious. When I took the survey, I think I was not. So I thought I could do this. But I also know how scary it is for a lot of people. So that's how I got involved. And like I tell people, I came in kicking and screaming. And I keep going back to nursing because I love nursing. I'm a pissed off sex educator, but I really love nursing. And I teach nursing. That keeps me grounded. But this is where my heart is. And I understand that. So I can do this, and I love what I do. But it also pisses me off that we are not further along than we are. So I appreciate you guys coming. Because without an army, you can't do it. You can't change it. The Me Too movement didn't become Me Too until a movement came. Not one, not two, but many. And we all fight for the fight in our own way. But it's important to have that knowledge base. So I hope to learn from you and you learn from me too. Because every time I go out and do any of these things, I learn things. And that's important for me. And hopefully you'll get something out of this too. I try to gear this towards what you're doing. And I went around to some of you and I thank you for the information about where people are from. Because when I go to conferences, I'm pragmatic. I want to get something that I can walk out right then and there and take back and use today. And so hopefully I will give you those pieces, a couple of pieces for the variety of people that I, I talk to. And, and what your um, background is and what your passion is in working in this field. All right, so, okay, section five. All right, all right. So here's that interactive piece to earn our first break. Here we go. So, growth and development. This is a nursing lecture. I modified it. Any nurses out there? I knew that would be a long nurse. Okay, <laughs> this is a nursing lecture. This is normal growth and development. You psych people, this is what you do too. I have psych degrees. Mine are in psych when I went back. There's so many things that I had to go back and get to work in this field. From zero to five, in the neurotypical world, what is going on with that twit from zero to five? Be careful. I am confined up here, otherwise I'd go get you. Tell me, what's going on? How many parents do I have in here? Okay, come on, parents. You can lead the way. Normal development. What is that dream doing? Crawling, walking. What else? What, body training? Body training. Yes, I'm like, body training. No, no, no. Okay, body training. What else is going on? Playing. Playing. 
Zero to five. Exploring. Exploring. Learning. I would say we're doing parallel play. Yeah. We do parallel play. You have your side of the sandbox, I have mine. We grab each other's toy. Connection fit. Zero to five. What else is going on? Language. Language. Awareness. <laughs> I'm a girl. I'm a boy. I'm a what? Whatever. I want to grow up and be like mommy. I want to be like daddy. Emotional connection. Trust versus mistrust. Maslow's theory. All of these things are going on zero to five. Critical stuff. For normal life growth and development. Five to ten. What's happening with that clip? More social, more, more social. What else? What are they being introduced to? School. What are they learning at school? Friends. Friends. They're learning there's other ways to do things besides mommy and daddy's way. They're expanding their knowledge base. Susie's parents let him be daddy. You know, all this crap. So, what else is happening? Five to ten. Self-discovery. Play doctor, play nurse, play experiment, whatever they're playing now. I don't know. Don't know. They're still playing. Mm -hmm. They're beginning body language. Body language. Awareness. Correct. All of those things happen. Okay. My favorite years. Mm -hmm. 10 to 15. What's going on? Yeah, you can face some hearing. What's that? Puberty. Puberty. Yeah, let's talk hormones. So I always tell parents when I do parent conferences, I come in with the hormones. When they start getting the notches, bring them over here. I got a notches down pat. What else? What else is going on? Puberty. Come on, remember those days. None of us probably want to go back there, but we remember them. What was going on? Rebellion. Rebellion is beginning. What else? Becoming sexually attractive. Becoming sexually attractive. All of those things are happening 10 to 15. It's happening younger now. So, you know, it's as early as 9 and 10. Scary stuff. Okay, easily influenced when it was popular. Easily <laughs> influenced, most popular. Boy, do I have stories about that. And then 15 to 22, what's happening? Sexually active. Sexually active for some, for many. What else? Driving. Driving. Voting. Voting, okay, voting. Moving away from home. Moving away from home? They can afford it. That's yeah. Okay. College. college, work, dating, true loves, all of these kinds of things. So let's go back here. Between the ages of about 10 to 15. I have a son and I have a daughter. Now I knew. When my daughter hit middle school, understanding psychology that my influence was going downhill. It's amazing how dumb parents become. How many of us remember our parents or have lived through this that we became stupid during a certain amount of age and then became smarter as the child got older. Anybody experienced that besides me? Oh, okay, but good. I love being in a group. If not, that's okay, I'm good with it being single. So my daughter had a bestest, bestest friend. Her name was Victoria. Victoria, my daughter was in sixth grade at the time. Victoria knew all, she was most popular. She had an older sister in high school. Older sister seemed to be more active socially than her parents wanted. And so Victoria would overhear arguments regarding toys and dating and birth control and STIs and all kinds of things. And Victoria would hear snippets. And of course, she'd come back to school and be all knowledgeable because 
she was all knowing because she did have older sisters. And so, when my daughter asked me about menstrual cycles, I said, Well, sweetie, I hate to tell you, but you're probably not going to have one for quite a while. In our family, we're called late bloomers. So, and she said, Well, you don't need to tell me anything about it, Mom, because I know it all. I said, Awesome. Knowing full well that my mental capacity with my daughter was sliding down fast because Victoria knew so much more than her mother. <laughs> my daughter's mother, me. So I said, Well, please tell me. Tell me about period. See if anything's changed in several years. <laughs> Sister. And when she gets to the part about asking, it's 
Victoria what her sister's crab's names were. And it's really hard sometimes, you know, when your kids kind of throw you for a loop to not sit there and not give emotions. And I'm driving, <laughs> I'm having a real hard time not cracking up, which doesn't help in the empathy part. And then so I say, well, what is she named her? And that didn't put me in a brownie point. <laughs> I said, I guess we'll talk about some STIs here <laughs> because we're going to hear a bunch of stuff. And since Victoria is very good at giving you knowledge, I might need to give you some other information. So between those ages, when we become stupid and their friends become all-knowing, that's scary time. Because it's hard to counteract that. You can't. My son, on the other hand, I don't know if he went through this phase, drop him off at school, say bye bye, have a good day, pick him up. Never had all the emotional turmoil that my daughter had. Except for, you know, Mom, I really don't want to be seen with you driving me to school. So that's going to be a little difficult because it's hard to drive without looking over the dashboard. <laughs> so I said, tough to, you're going to have to, you know, everybody else's parents, I know, I know mom, but I don't want to be seen with you. I get it, honey. Suffer. By the second one, it's like just suffer through. So at one point I did tuck down, and I did when I got there. So my son wouldn't be embarrassed to be driven by his mother, which I might, well, who the hell would you be driven by when you're 12 years old? <laughs> We're not having 10, 12, 20 kids. We're having one, two, three, single digits. And parents want perfect. And parents go through grief and loss, all the stages of grief and loss, when they discover that their child is not neurotypical. And that is difficult. And then you pile on all the therapies and the battles and the fights that occur to you. All of that begins from zero to five. So the twin's going through these therapies. What else is that twin doing? What's that? Not what they're supposed to do. Licking floors. Licking floors. Aggressive behaviors. Aggressive behaviors are starting. What else? Tantrums. They have delays. They have delays. I don't hear the body training. I don't hear all that stuff out there. Five to ten, what's going on? Body training, speech. Sometimes speech is delayed until eight or people with autism. It can be delayed. Seriously, and there's nothing wrong <coughs> with speech, but it is delayed or not non-existent. What else is happening from five to 10? Learning how to feed themselves, learning their ABLs, activities of daily living, and nursing from using in the morning. Refusing to eat different types of foods, but they can't touch, or they can't do this, or they can't do that. That's an autistic thing. It's primarily, you know, have to be the same texture, have to do this. I was like, oh my God. So, yeah, potty training. And where are they going? They're going to programs, they're going to school. And they are exposed to other kids with special needs. And they're put in a special classroom. Or they're included. And what are they learning? 
from social skills. What else are they learning? That they're weird. That they're weird. They're different. What else are they learning, Tanya? They're being pushed around and being bullied. They're being pushed around and bullied. They're not right. I don't know if you notice, but kids are nasty and mean. They're just nasty little critters. That's a learn to be nice. That's a learn to be compassionate. It's not something we learn easily. We're very egocentric coming out. Some of us stay egocentric. And it's very difficult to do that sharing thing and caring thing and all that empathy thing. And there's only so much training and so many conferences you can go to to acquire those skills. What else, are you, what else did you learn in special school, Tanya? That there's a special place in the back room that has to be that that people come. <laughs> so how many how many days of stripper and stripping did you see? On the average, five days a week. Pumping the bean bag? Yes. Grabbing, touching inappropriately? Yes. I don't know about your school, but I didn't have that special bean bag in the back. That you want to take a break and go back there and pump the bean bag? I see those bean bags in the classrooms and I nearly die. I mean, who the hell's washing this thing? But I have special ed teachers and I have teachers that say, and I'm not talking sensory room stuff. That's different. I understand that. But I'm saying if Sally or Johnny feel the urge that they can go in the back and pump the bean bag or go in the bathroom. I don't know about you, in my school we didn't have bean bags, we didn't get to hump anything, we didn't get to go in the bathroom to masturbate. I know, I, I, I went to public school and I also went to a private school and, and I didn't have that. How many schools did you go to? Approximately few. How about 15? Was this common in all of your schools? Yes. That's what we don't realize. So, when we're talking about sexuality as we age, it's already been exposed every day at school. This is common knowledge. My daughter's learning about butterflies and names of crabs, and she is seeing inappropriate sexual behavior from the day she goes to school. And then all of a sudden, we're supposed to say, oh my God, we're not supposed to do that. Really? Really? Well, it's been accepted all this long, all this time. First problem in the world of disability is a torture. All right. 10 to 15, what's going on in the world of disabilities? What are they doing? Puberty. Parents ain't ready for that. They're still working on the tread pumps, the, the therapies, the feeding yourself, the this, the that, and now puberty hits. Do you think they understand people with disabilities or get information regarding puberty and what's happening to their bodies? All right, one thing in the neurotypical world is how many of us had a sleepover or were invited to sleepover as a kid. Raise your hand. How many sleepovers did you go to, Tanya? None. How many times were we called and or called our friends, even on those old phones, you know? Uh, for some of you who don't understand those cord corded phone things, I think I was back then. Um, but how many good times did we call our friends to meet us at the mall, go to a movie, do something on the weekend? Anybody here? I actually did have friends back then. They weren't embarrassed by me. Okay. How many times did you have friends call you or, or you call them? None. How many birthday parties did you go outside of the classroom? I know we have those special classes. 
Happy birthday, my friend. Everybody gets a freaking cupcake, and everybody, no, 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 that's crap. I'm talking real birthday parties. Yeah. Now, my birthday party's going now. So, our social development is very different than people with developmental disabilities. When did you have your first friend, honey? At uh, 20 years of age. What is this wrong? I didn't have a special bean bag. But I had friends. So I cannot compare my typical or typical social growth and development to people with developmental disabilities. It's different. And I'm not talking about seeing or exposing kids with developmental disabilities to neurotypical. I'm talking about typical social interactions that you do outside the classroom. And that is very difficult for our guys to be invited on the weekend or do this or do that. We're very big on taking our guys to an activity. They do bowling. They do this. They do that. But, but when we go bowling, it's not about throwing the damn ball and hitting a pin. It's about that interaction. It's that social piece. And our guys don't know that. And that's the critical difference between them and us. Right there. So, to have a healthy self concept, we need all of these. We need knowledge in this. We need to understand our body. That puberty, boobs come out. We get hair. I have students who pluck their hair out because they don't understand. They get their period, they think they're being murdered down there because they're bleeding, they don't understand. Boys get erections, they don't understand how to deal with it. And I've got to fight like hell for these guys to get these services. I was told, and we'll go over this, because I've been at this, I'm a dinosaur, I've been at this a way too long of a time. And I tell people, I know a lot about this. A lot about this. Outside of this, I don't know. Help me, I don't know. But in this this field, social, se sexual, and abuse, I got a lot of knowledge on that. I love learning new stuff all the time. But one of the problems is, is that when I get heads of Various organizations that are very instrumental in people's lives with disabilities telling me they don't need to know this stuff. They don't need to know about their body. When they hire therapists and the therapist comes out after several thousands of dollars to teach a young man about his spontaneous erection, and the conclusion was you just put a pillow over it. Okay, what? I was in a meeting with the heads of like 10 departments, head of psychiatry, head of case management, head of this, head of that, head of medical, and all the heads. I thought I was just going into a meeting to talk about a couple of little things. But I always know when I'm in the hot seat. I love the hot seat. I'm so used to the damn hot seat. I'm sat, and everybody's, you know, the panel is like this. I'm here, and I think I'm just going to go in and talk to these three people. And then I put it here to that. And Oh, problem solved, critical thinking, I know what this is. Let's go for it. Breathe, now I'm ready for you, what you got? What I was told was, for this one young man, who's 6'10", I mean, you know, his legs come up to here, so it's kind of hard to not miss his spontaneous erection, so it's like <laughs> And he's 14. I like, now, you're straining my neck. I can't 
do this. Perfect. So now we can sit and look at this level. And what I was told was it, it was this panel. But yes, after several months of therapy, the therapist put a pillow on. So now this group of people, and most of it's women, because you know women dominate this field. But there are three men there. And I love it when I get a mixed crowd. And now Harry happens to be the head of psychiatry. And he and I were talking before the meeting. And he goes, Stacy, I only have three months to retire. I said, that was awesome. So when the head person brings up this case, and I see Harry just putting his head. <laughs> so I'm like, and Harry's like, I just have three months to retire. And he's like, three months. I'll, I'll try to do that. <laughs> But this person is pissing me off again as usual. He has a way of doing that. And I said, okay, all right, let's look at this one case. And I said, I'm gonna paint a picture because I love visuals. I said, we're walking down to McDonald's together. We're gonna go get our Happy Meal or Big Gulp or whatever. You know, we're gonna go get something. And all of a sudden, one of you men, because there's only three of you in this room, have a spontaneous erection. Because you're 13, 14. How many of you carried a pillow and kept walking with a pillow? Because <laughs> that doesn't look weird. I said, that's your solution to this? I said, you've got to be kidding. Because the mother was screaming and yelling for services because she knew, unfortunately, our reputation precedes us in saying, no, I don't need so, I don't need banana. It's pretty simple. I can help you with this. It's pretty easy. But I'm like, why wouldn't you want to teach that to assist this young man? In learning how to deal with his spontaneous erection and being able to fit into school better and not be made fun of and be able to start learning to self control. Why wouldn't you want that? Well, Stacey, if we referred everybody to you, then you know, you'd have over 90% of people again. I said, that's okay. Because then we train other people to do this. I'm all over trying to train people. You don't want to send me? I don't blame you on a penny in the butt. But let me train them. They'll be nicer. But we don't want to walk around with penis pillows. So I came back to my office, banging my head on the post saying, I got the latest and greatest idea. We're going to have a sanctioned penis pillow. I want a fanny pack that says PP on it. And like the <laughs> and I want you to be able to put your hand in there. Oh yeah, this station. And then, if you order two, you can have a little hand sanitizer. <laughs> I'm like, how do I get them assisted? But it's only when we can do this and make it ridiculous that people understand that we shouldn't want to do that. But I'm constantly making people think their logic and taking it to the ridiculous level and saying, is that what we're doing? We're going to carry around penis pillows? Or I think we should just have it strapped. Have it ready. Do the fanny pack penis pillow thing. I said, no. Come on, people. We shouldn't be this weirded out over normal bodily functions. Privacy. My guys in the developmental disability world do not understand privacy. Tom is raised in schools with strippers, brokers, grabbers, masturbators. I wasn't raised with that. I don't know in your school, but I, there wasn't a course on that. But this was every day. Why would they have privacy? I teach parents about knocking. 
and walk? No. How many people knock and walk into the kids' room? How many people knock and just walk in? Nurses are mad about that too. But a work in poetry, so you know, it's the original press in the hospital. So I teach knock and wait. And you wait for a response. And then I get, well, they don't know how to respond. Well, we teach how to respond. Oh, I'll wait a minute or I'll make it or whatever. But you say something. But people with disabilities are not raised with privacy. Now, we all are, we're, we're, some of us have that, that embarrassing picture of your kid with a diaper hanging down, running halfway naked through your house or running around two and a half, three. Anybody have that besides me that I can use for ammunition for later when they have a girlfriend and things like that? He tried to get all those pictures. I have one left. But our guys are not raised with privacy. So walking into the bathroom and they're not locking the stall or just exposing themselves is not untypical. We don't understand what public and private is. So why, if you've been raised with it from zero to 20 in school, why would it all of a sudden be an important thing? It's not. Social skills. Talked about that a little bit. We need to provide natural opportunities for kids to be invited to have mentors, to be invited to social activities outside of the controlled classroom or controlled play date things. We want socialization to occur, so we need to train and teach people how to do it and assist and bring on someone. I didn't know it at the time, but that's what I was doing with Debbie. And yeah, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. All I wanted to do was make sure she didn't embarrass the hell out of me with my friends. But eventually she did come out to pizza parties and she did go to places with me and she did act appropriately. And we'd high five and we'd hug and we'd do all that. And that was normal. But yeah, we had to do a lot of groundwork first because if she embarrassed me, I was gonna kill her half the time. And I would stare and glare at my mother and my mother is very good at just deal with it, baby. I'm still dealing with it now. So these are the issues. It's beyond the nine to five or seven to three or whatever the school hours are. It's beyond this. Socialization occurs in the evenings, on the weekends, all of those kinds of things. They need to learn. What are the five things you need to know to call someone a boyfriend or girlfriend? What are the four things you need to know to call someone a friend? Those are critical things. I don't know what to do about that. Healthy sexuality. What is that? Is that watching the bean bag being pumped to death? No, it is not. It's being afforded the opportunity to go on dates, to do things, and not think it's cute when they're holding hands. It's not cute, it's so cute for them to hold hands and walk down the street than it is for my husband and I to do that. It's belittling. Well, and it's a view. It's normal stuff. They go on dates. You have to kiss a few frogs and frogettes before you find somebody who's compatible and I tell you, I'm damn near perfect. And I tell my husband all the time. <laughs> For some reason, he's not absolutely positive on that, but he's fooled enough after, you know, 38 years that he's sticking around. But they need the opportunity. Healthy relationships. So we talked about the five things you need to know to call someone a boyfriend or girlfriend, because do I deal with people who you serve that are 13, 14, 15, and that's how many people serve that population? All right, forget that. We don't care about dating. All right, how many people deal with 13 and under? Well, then what the heck the rest of you doing? 
<laughs> you got to be seeing some people over 18. Okay, 13 and up. That's 13 and up. Okay, over 18. How many people here have heard from their clients that they want boyfriends and girlfriends, they want dating, they want this or that? Okay, thank you. I asked the wrong question. Forget it. We're going to talk dating then. I know, I know. I blew it. So, we're talking about the five things. Now, I have to preface this. Tanya and I have done this for 20 some odd years. We've only had two audiences ever get it. So, don't feel bad. <laughs> we're going to set you up. And hopefully, you won't fail. But if you do, you're in a lot of company. So, you need to know five things to call someone. Significant other, partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, soulmate thing, whatever. Whatever the current term is now, I don't give a I don't care. Never mind, I don't care. <laughs> there are five things you need to know. What are they? Their name. Yes. Last name too. Uh, not as critical, but okay. Last names change. People change them all the time. So in my program, I don't even care if they have a last name because we usually keep the first one. So what else do you need to know? Uh, we're going to assume it's age appropriate. We're not going to get into the legal card right now. <laughs> what else? Age. No, I didn't want that one. Okay. What, oh. what they like to do. Okay, likes and dislikes. Yes, likes and dislikes. Two, two out of five. Not bad so far. Their likes and dislikes. They like you. Ah, reciprocity. Yes, they like you the same way that you like them. I might know your name. I even might know how you like your coffee or if you like coffee at all. But that doesn't mean we're going to be soulmates for the rest of our lives. So we both have to agree that this is something that we want. So relationship then? So if you're married or not? Oh no, we have to sell out books on that. Nah, we don't care. What's that? Trust. 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 Nah, that's way too And then you're going to tell me about honesty and respect and love. <laughs> Sexual orientation. No. Smarter than you think. Oh, I love that financial status. <laughs> Say it. No. <laughs> Protection. <laughs> now you got my. Now you got my. They have your report. Do they have to have protection? Um. No. I don't. I know I'm not a kid. Oh, that's that legal job. No. <laughs> We're going to assume they're of age and they're not doing it with Uncle Bob. Three things. There's a whole school. And you don't go away. Similarity. Oh, so they have to be um, culturally the same? Mm -hmm. Nah. <laughs> Let's just stop that right there. That one could be very contrary. We can go on a whole other tangent on that one. Money, no. Transportation, no. Oh, okay, okay. We're going to go with their phone number and address. Phone number and address. It helps to, to know how to get in contact with a you know, person. Or if you just see them in class or you have a question. One more. Quality time. Quality time. Quality time. Nah.
I see. But we're talking about love and respect and, and transportation and financial and family and cultural. It's all good. And my guys don't have those five things. In the world of disabilities, how it looks like is I go up to you and I say, <coughs> do, uh, what's your name? And you say, Debbie. Do you have a boyfriend or girlfriend? Yes. No. You say no. <laughs> we're boyfriend and girlfriend, okay? Okay. And now we're boyfriend and girlfriend. Is that not how it's done in my world? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so don't tell me about love, respect, and transportation. Wow. I just say your name. You have one? No? Okay, we're boyfriend and girlfriend. Or girlfriend and girlfriend. Whatever we want to be today. So then I say to you, okay, this is what boyfriend and girlfriends do, and this is what girlfriend and girlfriends do. And the number one place for sexuality is the bathroom. Not single. That's internet. But together is the bathroom. I have a whole lecture on the letter B equals sexuality in the field of disability. Plus P. Plus the one exception, some English less exceptions to the rule. The letter D is for dose for dates, but that's a whole other way. So now we're boyfriend and girlfriend and girlfriend and girlfriend and we're, we're soulmates. Because I know, because you don't have whatever. And now I am. And so now, because we are, we can go do this. That's how it is in the field of disability. So if you don't understand the norms within the field of disabilities and social sexual, how can you deal with it? You cannot compare your background. It's a parallel world. Sometimes it overlaps, and we'll talk about that overlapping, but most of the time it's parallel. So, Exploitation, ooh, fancy words, for tricks people play to get you to do things you don't want to do, to get you to do things that you're not aware of, not even aware that it's wrong. It's how I trick you into doing bad things. And this is what most parents are most afraid of. The biggest advocates that I have are parents. Because I lecture all over and I tell parents, I know what the hell you want. You want three things. You want your twit to grow up to be halfway healthy. You want them to be as healthy as possible. You want them to have to be happy most of the time. Not have major regrets about what they do, what they did, their job, whatever. You want them to be happy. And the third is safety. You want that kid safe. You want them to grow up and to be safe. How can they be safe if they don't understand tricks people play? And the model that we use in the field of disability is the medical model. And that's called supervision. And that just sucks because it don't work. Because the person with that student, with that client, with that person with a disability is knowledgeable on all this crap. And the person with a disability is not. Regardless of the power struggle. When you have control and power, abuse is sure to follow. And abusers and perpetrators are pretty damn smart. They don't do it in front of people. They separate. We'll get into that after, after our first lesson. But we're not gone. We are in thinking that this model works and it doesn't. So I tell parents, if you're thinking that it's the paid people that you have supervising approval, so where does learning occur? Well, let's talk about it in, in the typical world. Where does learning occur? Where do we learn social sexual knowledge? In home, from parents to begin with until they become stupid. Then where 
changes. And that hair down there and under your arms is normal and you don't have to pluck it out. If you do get a period, but it varies from person to person that you don't need to wear a pad for five years. You know, that there's ways to deal with it. Hopefully, you know, if we teach it right, you, you're not, you don't have someone dumb like me wearing a pad, you know? And so my older sister said, what are you doing? My body, oh, jeez. <laughs> you know, so these are the things. You have to show this. I have guys who were looking at in, in other people's underwear at penises and they were labeled pedophile. No, they didn't understand that penises like bodies grow. And they didn't understand why this person had a little penis and he had such a bigger one. It's like, they don't understand. We talk about growing up. We talk about public and private. Why is this black and white? We have black and white, we have graphic arts, colors, as well as photographs. Why? Some people, Especially in the autism world, cannot handle, some cannot handle photographs or colors. So you start with black and white and you move forward. Some can handle pictures, but they can't handle graphic art. Okay, so you have a variety. Who cares? But you teach. We talk about feelings. Most of my guys are taught that they're supposed to be happy. And they should be thankful that I am working with them. Or they have the opportunity to come to my program. Well, full money. I paid. Not well, but I paid to do this. I choose to do this. If I was really smart, I'd get a job in that network. Paid more, better benefits, but I choose to do this. They don't have to be happy to work with me. It's my job. And I earn your respect. I don't get it all right. Oh, no. <laughs> this is critical because I fight this every day from parents, people with disabilities, educators, therapists, heads of companies. Tell me this stuff. And it's wrong. They can't understand? Really? Or oh, we're not teaching it right. I don't tell anybody I can't teach. Especially if they only have single or dual disability. Three, I have problems. Deaf, blind, and dominated away. I have the sound the ability. But just two, I can handle it. People with disabilities can't have a real relationship? What the heck's that? What's real mean? Sound like that RN? Real nurse? What's a fake one? I know my husband. I know fake nurses because they wear the little white hat and the really short white dress. <laughs> <laughs> my husband said, where's that? I said, shut up. This is not a real nurse. So what is a real relationship? Is that that Kardashian thing? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It's that Jersey twist. <laughs> oh, that one is just like. Or, or I know what it is, it's meet your bride if she's walking up. Or back to her, back to it. I am not going to ask how many are hooked on reality TV shows. But give me a freaking break. That's real relationships? Or is it the five things? People with disabilities should always be nice and happy. How many of us have heard Down syndrome people are just cute little cherub things and they're always happy? Anybody heard that one? Oh, yeah. I don't know what it is because I always get the pissed off ones. I keep telling them, no, you're supposed to be really nice and happy. I don't know if you missed that 
that lecture, but that's what you're supposed to be. So why are you pissed off in my office? I don't know why you're pissed off. But that's a bunch of junk. People with disabilities should respect authority. Well, who the hell isn't an authority over someone with a developmental disability? When I do a lecture on disabilities, just general disabilities, and I play, let's pick one. How many of us would pick developmental disabilities? Don't you think people with developmental disabilities don't know there's a lowest on the totem pole even in the, in the disability world? They know that. Mild, borderline, developmental delays, they know. They are a, I don't know, Grand Canyon away from any other disability. Respect authority. But we know if you work with autistic folks, they have a hard time with it. Know what those authorities do. They don't knock and wait. They walk in your space. And you don't do that with someone with autism. Not easily. So we're learning that this myth is a myth. We earn respect. You don't get it because you have a piece of paper on the wall that you spent $40,000 an hour in student debt for. You don't. Get it because you have a badge or you have a black robe or you have this or that. You earn it by showing and demonstrating that you know what you're doing and you're there and your actions and your words match. You don't say one thing and do something else. That's how you earn respect. People with disabilities are defenseless and powerless. Well, hell yeah, keep them ignorant. That's how you control people. Mm -hmm. Don't do it in nursing. Doesn't teach you. You can't really do it. We give you paralyzing drugs. It is great. We can make you powerless. Now we're supposed to be that. Oh, that's helpful. This serves a dual purpose. That's what it's helpful. But it's there to help you. Defenseless and powerless keep people ignorant. Knowledge is power. When they know what the clerk smells, there's no victim or less victim. Because most crimes against people with disabilities is not done by gunpoint. It's not done by knives and bullying. It's done with manipulation. Come on. It's easy peasy picking. And if you've worked in the field, you know this. Research indicates compliance, being naive, perceived as likely to keep a secret, easily controlled, lack of support networks, lack of accurate information are the number one reasons for people to be abused. Sexual problems, the number one reason, lack of accurate information. Lack of opportunities. Natural opportunities. Not those twice a month outing things. Not the planned play dates. Not the taking a bowling, taking you home. It's that interaction. History of sexual abuse and exposure. Ooh, we're going to talk about that. That's the, that's the, that's afterwards. Part of their disability or personality. A lot of people blame disabilities equals inappropriate sexuality. Really? I don't think so. Not my research, not the research that holds out. It's a lack of knowledge and exposure to it from grade school on. Impulse control problems. I get that a lot too. Well, excuse me. My feeling is if I don't get the hump of being bad in the back and ring into you. It's a simple rule. I don't 
I've met people that cannot control it. Not in my practice. Unusual arousal or attraction. We can talk about that a little bit. Autism, you know, that comes into it, into play, but it's not, it's not fetishes. Autistic folks or unusual um, attractions to feet or smelly parts, that's not a fetish. We'll talk about that later. But well, the last one, I want to. In my 31 years of dealing in the field of social sexual, people with developmental disability, I met two people who said, I don't give a damn about all this. And they knew all of this and they said, I want to. Third are in jail. Special jail, but they're in jail. What's that? Or is it regular jail? <laughs> That's a whole other lecture. No, I haven't felt yet, but yes. I want to. It's a power thing. And they don't give a damn about anybody else. But like I said, over 30 years, I've had two people with developmental disabilities who knew right and wrong, who knew public and private, who knew underage, who knew, who knew, who knew. In here. Okay. Well, why don't we take a ten minute break for Susanna or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's get back to the one. Girl Scout 
cheerleader types trying to teach sexuality, and I just couldn't do it. I wasn't happy dappy and cutesy woosy, and I, I couldn't do it that way. Because what I knew of the field of sexuality in the field of developmental disability wasn't nice and cute. It was through abuse <clears throat> that most people in the field of disability learn about sexuality. So I couldn't make it cute and nice. I couldn't do the sixth grade talk about your body thing. Your bodies had already been abused. So I was pissed. So because of that, breaking my, my ear. <laughs> because of that, I knew that I needed stuff. And they used to get to do all the things, and I have more, I have other guys, and I have other girls, and you know, I have all families and all this big money. But they get to do things that I cannot do legally. <laughs> <laughs> but it's awfully good to have those visuals. So we'll talk about that right soon. rate of abuse in the typical world. Abuse of women is what? One in five. One in four, one in five. Yes, no? One in three. One in three. On the right price, people. One in three. How many for how much what is the abuse and sexual rape and all of that for men? One in five? One in three? No, one in five. Oh, one in five. Not one in four, one in five. I think that's the latest. But this is all underreported. So, you know, whatever. So let's say every other. So if we count it out and look at each other, look at one in three. So look at one, one in two. And that's typical. Now let's look at the field of disability. Developmental disabilities, it's different. Different disabilities, it's different. So you can't put them all together. But let's look at developmental disabilities. It's seven times greater for people with developmental disabilities. Seven times. So if we're talking one in three, what are we talking about? So if I have 10 people lined up here, how many people have been abused? At least seven. And that's underreported. The average is around 85, 90%, really. <laughs> so my question to everybody is who isn't abused? Not who is, who isn't? And that's what brought me to this field. And kids with higher behavioral problems, more aggression, more sexual display, more inappropriate behaviors, have a higher risk. So, ID stands for intellectual disability. People with intellectual disability maintain a high vulnerability throughout their lifetime. It doesn't go away. You're not raised once or twice, and then all of a sudden the light bulbs go off or the abuse stops. It's maintained throughout your lifetime. Adults with intellectual disabilities are targeted. They're targets. They're easy pickings. That's what perps say. They're easy, easy. You can manipulate them with a cookie, with a soda, with electronics. 
to show you some things we're going to be bestest friends. Easy, easy. How many of us work with people with disabilities one-on-one -on -one and they look forward so much to you being there? That's specialized attention. For eons, I've been going to any agency and I said, my name's Stacy, I need to see Johnny or Susie and I need to take over an office. Whose office can I take over? Good luck. And they just let me in and I can do whatever. I'm like, you don't even know me. I don't even know me. Oh, and now you gotta show your driver's license or you know, whatever. What? That doesn't matter. The arrest rate, the perpetration rate, the, the conviction rate in the steel is so damn low, it doesn't matter. It's not like you have driver's license. Who cares? I'm not a safety practice to take my driver's license. So these are very low statistics, but this is what's being reported. But that's not the average. This <coughs> is the critical one. Sexual assaulted over eight times, or eight to ten times. The average is around ten. Tanya, how many times were you assaulted? Sexually assaulted. Great. I was three from about seven times. And sexually molested? Three times. How many attempts of suicide? Who believe they count? Okay, about 30 to 40 times. So we're talking about that shortly. This is wrong, people. And this is the medical model, supervision, that we're not doing. What we're not doing is teaching people with developmental disabilities the tricks. We're not teaching people. What the watch for? We're not teaching people about their body and healthy self sexual expression or relationship understanding. We're not teaching people. We're waiting for the perk. How old were you, Tanya, when, when you and I started working together? About 34. When did your first rape occur? 15. This is wrong, people. And we can make a difference. I'm going to put on a movie that, that Tanya and another co speaker have shared about their experiences. And then Tanya will talk to me. And it will. Because I have to. Um, Isn't it that little movie thingy down there? Oh, sorry. Yes. 
to tell myself, I'm sorry. You are safer to send your kid just to the out, just right here. Go, go away, just go. Then you are to put them in any place and pay people to be with them. And that's like that one. Because they trust their teachers, they trust their aides, they trust the bus driver, they trust, they trust, they trust. Because we're angels in this field. We have a special place in heaven to work in this field. We must be patient as hell to work in this field. And I'm impatient as hell to be in this field. I'm pissed to be in, I left happy nurse life to become a pissed off sex educator. And I tell people, I want to go back into nursing. Well, no, now I'm on fire. But I, I like teaching my nursing students. They're naive, they're cute, they're, they're you know, they're the same thing. They, they're naive and they want to help people and they're just clueless and they, they want to do things. And I'm just like, oh, you're so cute. <laughs> and we know patients lie. They're great. How are you? I'm better. I'm going to poke you here, shove something up, you do something. Is that okay? Yes. <laughs> Don't work with children. They don't lie. And, you know, if you hurt them, they say, ow, and they get mad. Or, but you do that to adults, and they're like, well, that's not so bad. I'm like, great. I'm going to show them another bad letter up here. <laughs> See, I don't like this one. So, the problem is in this field is that people with disabilities have learned to accept abuse as part of their lifestyle, so they don't know anything better. And we in society are very good at blaming victims for the abuse they curse to them. We do it all the time. The first victims that came out, survivors, victims, we'll talk about the difference between in a minute, but the first people that came out against Bill Crop. We knew they were liars. We knew they were just money hungry. They knew all of this. And then more people came and more people, and then we're like, whoa, 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 what? The Me Too movement, that's been around a long time, people. But it only picked up steam when? When we had more movie stars and more people. And then there's Harvey Weinstein who says, I'm innocent. This is just regular practice. This is what you do. You want a job? Then you have to perform oral sex. You want a job? You have to do this. You have to do that. That's just, that's just typical. Job development. Really? But we accept this. We blame the victim. You were raped because of the clothes you wore. You shouldn't have worn that outfit. You stayed out late last night, didn't you? You knew better than to go to that side of town. You took a drink from that person? Oh my God, you were asking for it. You walked across the school campus and it was 11 o'clock at night? Well, you were asking for it. How many times do we do this crap? When I lecture, at the universities, I'd say, I should be able to, as an experienced clown, strip naked, run around this damn campus, and nobody should, should sit there and bother me except to call psych psychiatry to come get me, or mental health, or whatever, or the police, to wrangle me and get me off. Because obviously, I don't know the public in front. But I should not be touched inappropriately. And yet, if I don't lock my car and I don't do this and I don't do that, it's my fault. Not the perp's fault for stealing out of my car because obviously I'm asking for it. No, it's my fault. If I get abused, it's my fault. Because I walked, because I talked, because I accepted the drink, or, or I did this late at night, or I walked across the campus, or I wore this outfit that says rape me. Really, I don't know a clothing line that says that. But we're very good at blaming the victim instead of blaming who we should be blaming. 
which is obviously a person who's doing something wrong. And it's no different in this field. And so, <laughs> we're going with our movie, and we'll show that movie later. Things happen, problem solved, critical thinking. It's the number one skill in this field. So, what I'm going to do is have Tanya come on up. And she's not as loud and obnoxious as I am, so she'll be using the mic. And this is Tanya, my cohort, a good friend. Her, Go ahead. her right hand person. Right hand person and the person that keeps me in check. Even my butt sometimes too. So go for it, bud. And like I was saying that the abuse started when I was 15 years of age and then at well, 34, but <laughs> I always like to start out by saying there's a history behind all of this. And the suicide attempt because I'm the fourth child of a family, and I'm the only child that is black with a disability in my family. I'm the youngest child, the baby, so you gotta love me. <laughs> um, but my uh, brother Jeff used to, um, used to uh, have to walk me to dad and mom. Dad and mom. Do I have to? Dad and mom. Dad and mom. Dad and mom. Dad and mom. Dad and like my great grandfather and my grandpa, they were all uh, former Baptist preachers. So, of course, I'm a PK, which is a preacher's kid. So, and my mom had work at the San Diego. City schools at the time. At, so, and um, growing up, I had seizures since I was 13 months of age. And my mom was always the protective one of me. So she had Jeff walk to school with me. And so I walked with Jeff and Jeff says, okay, Tanya, we're about away from the school. So walk behind me so my friends don't see you. But you no know, little sister. They always catch up to their big brother. So I caught up to my big brother. But then Jeff's friend saw me and he said, Jeff, do you know that that mark behind you? No, never seen her. But I did. That's for a rock set. So if they threw rocks at me, or at home, my mom said, what can I jump in and see if we can find a dress for Tanya? And my brother Jeff will look over, oh, Major Romar, the tent makers there. We get home and no dress. So, 
Oh, Mark, the tin maker was in every day. What he? Or Tanya, what? Open, snap of the head. The cup of still puppy. Or Tanya, it comes to drag down the street. Why know the head? It hurts still today when I see that truck going down the street. Or Tanya, don't look in the mirror. Or don't look at the camera. We break the lens or the mirrors. I won't look at the mirror today. I won't have my picture taken. <laughs> because of what I've gone through with my brother. But I come from a musical family. Musical. And my mom would get a pack of piano. My brother Jeff go up there. Witness go up there. Shannon go up there. I'm sitting in the chair. They have their backs turned. I creep up there, start singing with them. My mom turns around. Tanya, go sit back down. Wouldn't let me in the cabin. You know how that makes the um, tire feel? When she's not, she doesn't feel like she's the part of the family. Or about two years, two and a half years ago, I heard my dad said, Tanya, I love you. For the first time, I have never heard my mom say, Tanya, I love you. She never will. She buys me things, but she never say it. And that hurts. But the race started and being a church now, this is where this comes all into business. Um, being the race started at 15, parents were out probably at dinner. I normally don't go with them. So I'm home washing dishes. And then classmate calls me, Tanya, I need to help with my math homework. Okay, tell me what you need to help with. And now I need to come up and show you. Tell me what you need. Not this money to me. Tell me what you need. No, I need to show you. Okay. He comes over, shows me through the door. Come inside. No, I'll be here. No, come outside. You'll see that. No, I can see through the door. No, come out here. Okay. He gets me and kicks me down into my front yard. That was the first one. Then there were a couple more classmates. One that happened in the cafeteria. I found out he was the four timer and he hit his hand on my knee. And I got so mad that him, I just got up and I just slapped him in the face and ran out of the cafeteria. And there was a classmate that I, again, the B word, back up the bus. Press made in back up the bus. He wanted to me touch him and he wanted me to touch him and him to touch me. 
And he started just in the back of the bus. I really didn't want it, but he found a way, so. I had trouble with that, and then there was the newspaper sales guy. Of course, I don't know why. I'm always watching dishes for some reason. I'm watching dishes, parents aren't home again. Newspaper salesman, come on, you want to buy the union curtain? He already described. Come on. No. He walks away. We go back to the kitchen. And he comes back through the house, grabs hold of me, takes me into the to the living room, pins me down and makes me <coughs> in the living room. Then there was a candy salesman. He wanted Sell me some candy. No, I don't need any candy. Come on, I need this trip. No, I don't need any candy. Thank you, but no. So he turns around. I need to get to your restroom. I'm oh, sorry. Well, you don't have me use your restroom. I tell everybody on your block about you. Well, sorry. So he goes his way. I turn around, go back to the kitchen. Five minutes later, he comes back walking in, grabs me in the kitchen in the corner, starts raping me in the corner. Actually, there's a block of knife there, but I never did think about grabbing the knife. And then there was a Carl Jr. man, or what I call Carl Jr., a man driving a van. And he said, You want to ride? I said, No. Come on, I'm a doctor. You could. It's safe with me. Okay. But in just him, we got to Carlos Jr. He bought me hamburger fries and drinks. We sat down, he sat right next to me, started funneling me and touching my breasts and all this in the restaurant. And I felt really uncomfortable also I knew a uh, waitress that worked there. She wouldn't help me at all. I got up to leave, went to the restroom. He followed me to the restroom, then right there. Wait till I got out the restroom, grabbed me, took me out to his van, and raped me in the van. Then I moved in with my best friend, my best friend. She was working with a neighbor's sister, and she was the, the neighbor's sister was, was there, but it was just me and Sandy walking home, and the neighbor found us, and I went to go do some washing. Washing clothes is kind of different. Um, and he went over and talked to Sandy. And he took her to her bedroom. And he tried to rape her, but I came into the house and he heard me. And he stopped. Because he heard me. So I didn't go far. Well, a few days later, I went up for Joe's kid's house to see if their sister needed help because Sandy wasn't there. And I asked, does Sophia need me? Well, I don't know, but that's supposed to be a 
I found now the Theo was in there, not Theo was in there, Needs wasn't there. He was the only one there. We start talking. He raped me, got me into his room, raped me for three hours. I got finally got the way, went across the way, sat in the living room at our place, and then he said, Come here, that's mom. And all of a sudden he's gone. And I told her when we called the police at that time and, and reported it. And then three months later, I was living with Sandy at a different place. I went to Target, came back, and um, Came down to go to the bus to go home. Homeless man comes to me and asks me about the bus. And I said, I think he needs to buy it. And we start talking about it. He grabs my bag and he says, I want to use the pino fur at the box over there. And I said, Okay. He said, not here, so must be a fur by that tree, which was by trolley tracks. He gets me pinned down on the ground by the tree, rapes me, keeps me by the wood pile for three hours. And I said, I have a baby at home. I need to call my babysitter which was my best friend, Sandy. I got on the phone with Sandy and she said, Tommy, what's wrong? Where are you? I'm at the outbreak center. Tommy, stay there. I pointed the guy out to her and we went back and at that time, the Richard had called the police and the police was there at Albertson's to get the guy. And we went back and reported it to uh, my social worker. My social worker said, I still know a lady that you need to meet. You really need to meet her. And that's when I'm at Stacy. How old were you? I was 34. She was raped four times, three times before she left home. And then three or four more times after she left home. Where's what? Where's the parent involvement? Parent involvement. <laughs> how, how do your parents feel about sexuality? My dad uh, was a pastor. My mom's uh, San Diego um, City School. So they don't want their names coming <clears throat> real much. So. They don't want to know anything about that. They don't want people to know their daughters in the view. That is not uncommon for rape victims. That's not uncommon for anybody. We don't want people to know about that. Why? Because we blame victims. Parent involvement? How long did it take you, Sonia, to tell your parents that you worked for me and what the hell I did everything? <laughs> about 
all the various agencies that I've worked through and with, from regional centers to private agencies to school districts. This is not an easy topic. Where's the involvement? It's on all of our back. I don't care about ABCs and one, two, three. Now, why is he called this freaking washing dishes? This is a clean freak. Okay? You can eat off her damn floors. She's misorganized. She's GPS before GPS came out. She has these amazing skills. And all the skills that I don't have. I'm a mess. I have a big desk because I have piles and you touch my piles, I kill you. Do not mess with my piles. She has everything organized and indexed and all this whole system that I don't know how the hell she does it. But she does it. But I, I know how to say no. I have put myself in precarious situations many a time. And I haven't been raped or assaulted. Why? Because I know what perpetrators don't like. They don't like noise, noisy, obnoxious people. Can be one of those. I'm not afraid to raise my voice and call y'all. Why are you touching me like that? Get away from me. Get out of my face. That draws people in. Perps don't like noisy people. Neither do I worry, but that's a tip. Yes, something that stood out to me also is that you, you know, you used all the skills that you could and really invite people in because you didn't want to go outside, but you really tried to not put yourself in a situation uh, using those skills. But and let's talk about that. that. It still, still happens. How still incredibly vulnerable. Right. And let me tell you how. Let's play the yes game. Correct. Correct. But let me tell you the game we play, and that's the yes game. Tanya learned to say no at the age of 34. No one mean it. There's a no, 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 no. You say that's a preacher skill. And then there's no. I teach no and mean no. You look. Raise your voice, no smile, and you say no, not no. Difference. But we teach people in this field using the token method, yeah? We teach using rewards, and rightfully so for some things. I get that. But what we don't counter it with is, there are times you can say no. But we don't teach those skills. So all we teach is the yes skill. So we're going to play a game. We're out of, we're, we're mixing things up. Well, that's okay. We'll fix it at the end. I got to do is say yes. Because this is what we teach people with disabilities. At the end of today, I'm going to give everybody $100. Is that okay with you? The simple word, three letters. Okay, I'm gonna do a drawing uh, at the end of today and somebody's gonna win a brand new car. I'm looking at the Tesla. I can't afford any of them, but that's okay. I really like the electric thing. So you're gonna win a new car, is that okay? Yeah. Okay, now we're getting part of it. So this is where audience participation comes in and I don't get to do it. So I am going to come over and I'm going to touch your breasts, okay? No. No, 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 that's not the word. Three letters. <laughs> so I'm going to come over and touch your breasts, okay? Aha! <laughs> uh -huh. You're going to lose the car and the $100. The answer is no, of course. But if you have been trained from this big, and anybody who deals with rape in crisis or abuse therapy understands how victims are groomed, And you say yes, because you've always said yes. So why are all of a sudden you're gonna say no when someone's gonna touch you here? When you've seen people grab and touch, grab and touch since school age, and now all of a sudden you're supposed to say no? If it's okay at school, if it's been okay at home, why all of a sudden you're supposed to say no? I'm a doctor 
doctor, you can trust me. Well, I married one of those damn doctors, and they never, he's never picked me up in a bed. He doesn't have a bed. He has a little dopey echo. <laughs> little old blue echo. She's a star on the block. That's a plant. And he never picked me up. He said, I'm a doctor. You can do this. Take me to Carl's Jr., feed me, and then take me back to the car to rape me. I mean, how come we know that and Tonya does not? But Tonya has all of these abilities, but she doesn't know that. How come? Where did we fail her? It started at home, but it sure didn't end at home. Why aren't we teaching life skills? If you've been abused, it affects your whole life across the gamut. So let's go back to the myths. Because there's a whole can of myths in rape. Well, they'll get over it. No, we don't. Give them an ice cream or a soda and they'll forget. Have you ever forgotten any of the rapes? No. Does it affect your relationships? Yes. Does it affect you during certain seasons? Yes. Because certain rapes happen at certain times. This is typical for rape victims. It's also very typical for rape victims to change their body type, their hair, their, their clothing. They wear layers of clothing. Fine, we met in the summertime and it was hot as hell. And I don't do heat well. I'm stripping down to the, the bare minimum that I can get away with. Uh, we're going to go there, and then we'll come back. We'll come back. So Tanya, it was summertime, and Tanya was wearing like six, seven layers of clothes. And it was 100 degrees outside, and I'm nearly dying. I'm trying to stay civil and appropriate by wearing some, some you know, appropriate professional shorts and a, and a, a top. But you know, the air is blowing, the fans are blowing on it, because I'm dying. I just don't do heat. Anything above 85, and I'm like, ah, it's dripping. Okay, Tanya's wearing seven layers of clothes. Sweat is dripping off of her, and I asked her, are you hot? And she says, no. <laughs> and I'm watching her going, you know, something's wrong here. Because I'm watching you, and I'm getting hotter, and this is just not okay. And since it's all about me, there's a problem here. You've got to. Take some of these layers off. But see, she was sent to me by her social worker because the social worker had informed me this woman had been raped seven times, molested at least three to four times, and I needed to work with her. Well, I got Tanya in and I did my forensic interview and I asked her all the questions and she aced them. She knew all the right answers. She was a perfect 98, 99%. She had it down. And I thought, damn, there's a problem here. Because I'm sweating like a pig. She's, she's sweating and she's wearing seven layers of clothing. What she's showing me is not the person I heard about on the phone. What's wrong here? She knows the answer. She's been through this before. She understands what I'm supposed to hear. And she's got it. But see, that's the problem. We keep attacking the problem and saying, what? But nothing changes. Well, what a surprise. So, see, in my office, I have a big fancy desk, executive director desk, because I'm a big executive director, but it's really big because I have piles on it. And I need a place for all my piles. But I decided I was going to get around my big fancy desk and come over to Tanya. Don't try this. I'm an expert. I know what I'm doing. So I went around my big fancy desk and I came over and Tanya, I don't think I've 
slides now. This was the really the second time. The first time I just I just say hi, it's nice to meet you, we talk a little bit, but I don't get into hot and heavy until the second time because for most people with developmental disabilities, you become best friends by the second time. And I know this. So I'm gonna use it to my advantage. So I walk around and by then, you know, we, we know each other because I mean I'd already met her. So, you know, I already knew that she was just close. So she answered all my questions right, and I asked her about sex, and I asked her about this and what she knew and what she didn't know, and I did my forensic interview and she had a cat. But then I did this. Came around my desk, and see I had a one one seat couch thing. So she sat there and I came around and I said, Tanya, I have a couple more questions. Can I ask you? Okay. And she talked that low. It's always irritating because it was hard to hear her. So I came around and I'm I'm at a good social distance. You say this is a good appropriate social distance? Okay, yeah, that's good. Okay. Not for both. So I said, okay, Tanya, I, I need to ask you this question. Is that all right? Okay, great. And so I, I just need to know if like someone's coming up like this to you. Oh, don't want to kill you here. Um, is this okay for them? Is this is this okay with you? And she did. Awesome. I got everything that I needed to know. What did I what did I just learn? She's not gonna say no to nobody. She didn't know me from Adam, and she could answer all my questions correctly. But when push comes to shove and I'm going to go grab you, she's not going to do a damn thing. So we can teach, say no, say no. She's not going to say no. She's been grouped from here to say yes, to comply, to earn her stars chart, to get her token. And she's never been told when she can say no. So when she says that she learned how to say no at 34, she learned how to say no at 34 because we worked our butts off. How long did we work? Two and a half glorious years. <laughs> I was ready to choke her. That's how boring it was. Because I knew what she needed to do, which was to say no and mean it. And I had to fight 34 years of compliance. And we started with her saying no like, and it would irritate me, this squeaky little voice. And I'm like, no way is anybody going to take that and mean anything. But that's okay. Just like Debbie and the light bulbs. I know how to do this. I'm good at this. So first I had to figure out what pissed her off. Because she was nice and happy all the time, but I knew she'd get pissed. I knew that. Intrinsically, I knew she'd get pissed. Because I had heard about the rape story. And the one thing that always stood out and all the rapes that she handled, how, how the hell she is still beyond my capability. But there was one that really bugged her. And that was when? Someone trying to hurt my best friend's family. Awesome! Now I have a weapon. Uh, her best friend. See him. I could give her a visualization. I am the perpetrator and I am going to hurt your best friend, Sandy. Now I want you to say no to me. No! Awesome. Now I got a voice. Now I knew I had that voice because first I had to test. Because some people with developmental disabilities have a very difficult with their vocal. And they can't yell that loud. And I understand that. So you have to test that before you can hit the vocal. But I knew that because I asked her. 
She loves to sing. So I said, sing me the first bar of your favorite song. And she did. manipulate that and tell her we need to find your voice and your voice begins with you thinking about your best friend getting hurt because you do not deserve to get hurt and I need you to say no because parents are there whether they're there or not they're not there they're not there. School is not there. Therapists are not there. When it comes to perpetrators, it's you and the perpetrator. And you need to know how to do this correctly. And I know this works. So what happened a few years ago? I got on the bus. And I was going shopping, and this guy got on on the bus, and actually, when I saw him, I just had this stuff feeling stuff in my front. Then he said that cross from me, and he just kept looking at me, and still had this really gut feeling. Halfway to the mall, uh, the guy sitting next to me got off and I just pinned my book bag down so he couldn't sit next to me. Then we got to the mall when we were again take the trolley to the other mall and um, he got off the back door I got off the front door and we both took the glass elevator right to the trolley and he got in there before I did and I got in and he pushed the button to go up and I was looking outside what a beautiful day and the elevator stopped and it was just him and me in the elevator and I said, what's going on? Did the elevator break down or something? And I noticed he had stopped it. And he pulled down his pants. One of me touched his penis. And I said, okay, Tanya, it's just you and him. You don't want to go through this again, so we're at our training. I got enough nerve up. I reached around him, I pushed the button so the figure could go up to the trolley, the door opened up, I got out up there, got on the trolley, actually got on the same trolley car as I did. He said, Chris Cross for me. And he said, come on, you want to go back to Mary's son? Part of you being my friend down here, don't you? No. Come on, you really, really, really want to party with me and my friend down here. No. 
Come on, you really, 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 really put your skin in a bucket and go home and party with me and my friend. No. Got off that or the dry stuff had another small key. Couldn't get what he wanted. He got off that one. I want to grow spots in the chicken up. Got off, pulled out my flip phone, called my support person. They did pick me up. We went back to the office. Report this to the police. So, and that's where the story ends. <laughs> yell and scream and be assertive, things that she was not used to doing and things that are not usually approved or sanctioned in our world. We want compliance and control. But before I let you go to lunch, we've got the movie. I'd like you to watch the movie because I definitely want to introduce you, I know, to Heather. It's only three minutes. You're good. And then we'll have lunch. You, I've got that for you. I've got stuff. I'm going to play some games. It's going to be okay. But because the uh, presentation kind of got mixed up, I want to make sure that I cover a couple of things. You've got it on your papers, but I just want to cover it. Um, the problem that happens with our guys is that because they don't have the social sexual education, the understanding, the social norms, they don't have all of those things, then what we have by the time we hit high school <coughs> transition adult world, we've got issues. We've got issues regarding sexual inappropriate behavior. How many of you have worked with people within the developmental world with sexually inappropriate behavior. Yeah, okay. So this becomes a problem. And because everybody's addressing it differently, the student doesn't understand how to deal with this. Just as we went over the five things you need to know to call someone a boyfriend or girlfriend and how difficult that was, well, if people are talking about appropriate or inappropriate sexual responses and behaviors, then you're talking about your own personal social norms, your own personal feelings regarding this. I had a couple that I was working with and this guy was a peeper. He would peep in windows and look at, you know, girls in suites and undress. And he really wanted a girlfriend, but he, didn't, he was shy. He didn't know how to address them. But, you know, peeking in windows was his way of, of, of dealing with some of this. So I said, well, you know, that really doesn't work well. And women get a little upset about all that kind of stuff. So, so let's work on that social greeting and how to meet somebody. I had another guy that liked to meet women by going like this. And I said, well, you know, that, that's, again, problems if you problems. Women get a little picky about that kind of stuff. So I'm going to show you how you do this. We're going to turn your head like this. And bring it down just a tad. And that's called a handshake. And I'm going to tell you another trick. You say hi. Well, they don't want to talk to me. Start with hi and your hand here. Not here, here. <laughs> and we worked on this. And did I set him up? Yes. Did I manipulate him? Yes. I set him up with some people to practice at. And they shine. And I'm like, oh, hi. You know, my name's so and so. And so we started practicing conversation, things you ask. And all of a sudden, this is done, this is right, and he's starting to talk. But meanwhile, my peeper guy, he was peeping in windows and all of this, and so we worked on it. And he finally, we met a girl. Oh my God, it was great. We met a girl, and I'm like, awesome. Now we're going to set up like this thing called dating. 
Oh my God, there was a new concept that I told you. I made it up myself. You guys didn't remember it, but I did. I made that up. So we set up a dinner. He wanted to invite her over to, you know, pizza and a movie. I'm like, well, that sounds like a typical date night of me. And so he lived in a group home. Fine, okay, I've got to get rid of a few people. Okay, we worked on all that. So we did all that. Perfect. All right. So then he invites girlfriend over and they're sitting on the couch. I'm not there because it's a Friday night, you know, and I'm not sitting there supervising this. You know, we set it up. I had some of the general staff do shadowing. We all know what shadowing is, where we spy without spying, but we spy anyway. So, okay, so they were shadowing. So it was perfect, perfect. Well, they had a new staff in there. Not so perfect. I didn't realize they were bringing in a new staff that night. But anyway, they brought in a new staff. And here he is. Call him Bob. Do you have any Bob? No, there's no Bob. So we don't have a... Okay, Bob is my go-to name. Bob invited Sally over to, you know, pizza and a movie. Bob is sitting on the couch, and do you know what obnoxious thing Bob does? He reaches, and they're holding hands. Okay, holding hands, watching a movie, eating pizza. Okay, just want you to picture that. This new staff comes unglued and knows Bob's history of teaching and doing things. And she becomes unglued about Bob holding this girl's hand and basically says, you can't do that. You are sexually inappropriate. I love those words when they put them together. Inappropriately touching this girl. And tells the girl to go home. Bob then does what Bob does. That's how I got it. He was very aggressive and starts throwing things and tearing things up. And of course, now we've got an aggressive Bob. And I had worked for months on setting this stupid thing up and getting all the players right and getting rid of the sort of clients, other clients, you know, of course, effectively and nicely and all that. But anyway, I've worked on this. And so I get a phone call and I'm all excited because I'm like, okay, 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 okay. I get a phone call that Bob is now in serious doo doo because he ripped up the whole home. Sally's gone home. Bob's pissed. The staff are pissed because this one staff person is saying he's sexually inappropriate. Okay. So I am fit to be tied. And I don't handle things always so well. <laughs> I'm not a quiet soul. I don't contemplate. Meditation is damn difficult. If I can get through 30 seconds, I'm doing pretty damn good. So I'm having problems here listening to this on the phone and seeing. And people who know me best know when I go quiet, bells about ready to bring hoods. And I am dead quiet. So I walk into this agency, and it was a very good agency. Love this agency. It's kind of where I got my start. But anyway, I go into the agency and I go into the executive director's office. And she doesn't really like seeing me, but she sees me and she she appreciates what I do as long as I stay at arm's length. But I walk in and I say, Carol, do you have a moment? Oh, don't worry about it. You do. Shut the door. <laughs> no, she's looking nervous. I'm like, oh, no. you know me. I'm not even going to open up my briefcase. What's this? Well, I don't want you to come sit down right here. Because you know what? Big executive directors, they tend to have a big desk and then they have that little social area. <laughs> And I said, now I want you to picture this. We're on date night. Yes, Carol, we're dating. And I've worked months to set up this date. And I really like you. And I'm going to treat you respectfully and appropriately. Not peep through your window to watch, go to the bathroom or undress. I, I'm going to sit there. And I invite you over for a dinner and a movie. So we're having pizza. And yes, Carol, put your hand out. Yes, be scared. Be scared. I touch your hand. And I hold your hand. Like Stacy. 
And I said, I know, but we really like each other. Uh, <laughs> and I said, Dad, out of nowhere, the staff tells us that we're totally wrong and inappropriate. And I get up and I thrash the place because they sent you home and I am stuck with this moral police. And you tell me why Bob is now in trouble. Because I am telling you one thing, Carol. Either I stay, or this person goes away, or I get to train them. Because they have undone several months worth of work and getting him to the point where he is being respectful and correct. And in one five minute interaction, we have undone everything. Now I understand this person doesn't understand, but she is bringing in her own values. When she said, only married people hold hands. <laughs> what? Well, then I have been <laughs> unfaithful for a long time here, people. I said, give me a break. I can tell we can't have this. We've come a long way in working in this agency for 10 years. And in five minutes, this person has undone this. And I can't continue this. We have to be careful because our social sexual history, our social, social sexual being our feelings, our culture, our religion, all of that play into how we feel about this. <coughs> and we get that in a quick of opinion. But sexuality is not just based on put head A and slot B. It's not that. It's a <coughs> lifetime. And it does include morality, spirituality, values, culture, education, feelings, all of it. It's not one thing, it's a multitude of things. But when you don't have education and you don't have people who can explain in a way that encompasses all, one person can undo it. And that's what bothers me. Yes. I don't have that many hypotheticals. No, no, I don't have any hypotheticals. But did any, anything ever happen where she had to make amends to Bob? Yes. I got to over to see that. And she explained that it wasn't to try to put her on the spot, but to first train her and explain to her that although she got into the field because she had angel wings and wanted to help people and you know all of this. But then I had to sit there and talk to her about the realities of this world and understand that she doesn't get to bring her whole values into the job site. And then we had to talk about some of the sexuality and open our eyes on that. And then when the light bulb goes on, that's when I say, so how do we want to handle this situation? So just going up and saying, well, you need to say sorry to Bob. I mean, come on, give me a break. She's not going to know what and why. So it takes effort. And sometimes it's worth the effort, sometimes it's not. And I've explained to executive directors, especially when they hire me, there are going to be times you're going to love me, and times you're going to hate me, and times you are, you should be scared. Well, I think it would always be worth it to Bob. Oh, it's always worth it to Bob. But Bob lives in a, in a home that is controlled by other people. So that is part of the issue. When you work in a community and you live within a community, it's a community rule. And there's pros and cons to all of that. So now we move on to this. Most people with disabilities do not have accurate information. We've talked about that. So they have a poor sense of safety. They don't understand. And they put two and two together and it still equals two. They don't put it together correctly. An example of that, I had a girl that was referred to me 
Um, and she was living on her own and she was doing really good and she was doing mobility uh, training. How many people know mobility training out there? Okay, well, that's where we teach people how to access the bus, how to access the crosswalks, how to access the transportation and other kinds of things. Okay, so Susan was being mobility trained so that she could access the mall and she could access things. And, and her apartment was pretty darn good because she lived pretty much, uh, you know, just across and a block down from the mall and different shopping things and all that stuff. Okay, so to get to her apartment though, um, you know, hers was like right across the middle of the street. Okay, so most people would access Susan's apartment by parking across the street and walking in the middle of the street across the street. Okay, right. but in mobility training, we don't teach that. We teach you to go down to the crosswalk, do the little dopey thing, and then wait for the thingy to go off, and then you cross. And right. that's what we teach. But most of us jaywalk, all right? Because I know if I'm working across the street and I have to go all the way over there to get into the middle here, I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna move the table and I'm gonna get through it. Or I'm gonna scoop my butt around the table and go over in the middle. I'm not gonna do this. Okay, so. Susan was being mobility trained. So the mobility trainer is very good because they walk down, they push the button, they go in the end, and then they're in. Okay, good. Well, meanwhile, Susan is watching her workers and everybody else just jaywalk. So mobility training is ended. She gets her golden certificate. She's been hanging on her wall. And so the next day, or a week from then, she goes out and she wants to go, and the place she wants to go is across the street. So what do you think she does? Do you think she goes all the way down and pushes the stupid button and walks? No, because she has watched all of the people just jaywalk. So she jaywalks, and she gets hit by a car. Okay. Oh, poor Susan, okay. Okay, so then, you know, obviously mobility training didn't go well. So again, she's in re-enrolled in her mobility training. So again, they go through the whole crime, and then bingo, bingo, she gets another certificate, and for some reason, the second time, she gets bit by another car. Ah, <laughs> Susan just can't learn. Meanwhile, the rest of us are across the street. So... For some reason, I was called, and I'm not sure why, but, you know, I was working with, with Susan on some, some social psychology and this and that. And somebody asked me to find out what was going on with Susan. So I said, Susan, what's going on? And basically, Susan said, well, this is quote. I can't cross the street when there's a red car because red cars hit you. And I can't cross the street when there's a green car because green cars hit you. So I can only cross the street when when there's other colors because they won't hit you. Like really? Oh, I didn't know that. That's what she learned. But she said, well, I see everybody else crossing the street and they're not getting hit. Why is it me? I said, oh, I can answer that. I can answer that too. You don't have judgment skills. What? <laughs> so you don't have judgment skills. I can judge how far that car is going and how fast it's going, and I know when I need to haul ass to cross that street and when I need to just wait for that blue, green, red, yellow car to pass and then cross the street. I have judgment skills. That's not your skill. I said, you have skills in other areas, but this ain't one of them. I can judge distance and speed. And most of the time, 99.9%, I ain't going to get hit by any of those freaking colored cars. But you don't have that. And I understand that. And that's why mobility trainers teach you to go that way because it's safer. Not all the time, because sometimes those cars just go through, you know, so they're not guaranteed. But you're more guaranteed to be safe going that way than doing this. But I said, I have the ability to figure that out. 
You know. Well, that's not fair. I said, yes, God forbid. I said, but you can draw, and I can't. So that's not fair either. But we suffer through it. So she started doing some soft ones. No sexual information. If you're not given sexual information, but you're listening to music, you're you hear people talk about sex, you you watch it reality TV. You don't understand what's appropriate and what's not. And if you don't have people to talk to, trusted people to talk to about it, then you can't tell you what's reality and what's what's real and what's for kids. Inappropriate comments, very common. You're trying to put these pieces together. Sex, babies, family. Fuck, whatever, boom, but, and you're trying to figure out what all this means. And nobody wants to talk about it because it's not appropriate at school, it's not appropriate at home, it's not appropriate with your ILS worker, it's not appropriate with some, who the hell is it appropriate with? The best job I have is when I meet these students and I say, you know what, I'm paid to talk about sex all day. I talk about all these parts. I talk about all this stuff all day. That's all I do is entertaining. That's it. I, all I do is talk about this. They're like, really? I said, yeah, it's an amazing job. Like, how do I get that job? They said, well, stick with me and we'll see what we can do. I said, yeah, that's what I talk about. And I'm a nurse. Do you know how many people think that nursing, this is all we do all day? Nurses are, have just as many hangouts about this stuff as everybody else. When I teach nursing classes, I am I am told that classes that I get to teach are the reproductive and things like that because they, they the regular nursing instructors don't want to talk about that. I'm like, come on. So I bring out my dolls. I love it when I'm evaluated for teaching. Because I bring my dolls out. I have fake vaginas and, and penises, and I have the students get into groups to start talking and show and demonstrate. And I have my evaluator in the back, and I have condoms and all this stuff out here. And my nursing students are doing all this stuff. And the, the director is looking like, oh, God, I hate this evaluation. I'm like, I know, I love it. We're going to get comfortable with this, people. It's not that scary. We all do it. Come on. But how are people with disabilities supposed to understand if no one's talking about it? Or talking in a way that's over the head. So we tend to get higher aggression because they don't understand and it's frustrating. And self abuse, not uncommon at all. Because they don't know. And they get angry. And for most abuse victims, they self inflict. Tanya, what were some of the ways that you tried to hurt yourself? I would uh, I take razor blades and cut down my wrist and cut down my wrist and cut down my knees and cut down my belly button, cut down underneath my feet. Cut anything that my clothes would cover. I would overdose on aspirin. I overdose on any kind of pills I could find. I would mix drink. I mix. Well, my last one was ammonium bleach. Was the last one. This is not uncommon for rape victims to self-inflict. And why? Why did you do that, Tanya? What were you trying to achieve by doing those things? I had no one to speak to, so I thought maybe it'd be better if I wasn't around. Maybe I should just leave the earth. But God has to plan for me, and I'm trying to help others see that God has to plan for them, too. For many abuse victims, they will talk about the pain and just trying to get it out. And 
that's why a lot of cutting goes on. So let the pain out. So again, compliance, being naive, easily controlled by keeping secrets and without physical force, lack of social supports and a lack of information are the cornerstone for abuse to occur. Victim mentality, feeling isolated. Most people with developmental disabilities will talk to you about being isolated, being treated differently, special. I think I've ever understood special. Like what the hell am I, chocolate liver? Because life isn't special as anybody else. It's not special learner sometimes. So I don't understand that. We're all just people. And some of us have different abilities. So what? Yeah, I know when the cards are gonna about ready to hit me. I can figure it out. You can't. All right, so what? There are things that you can do that I can't. All right, I'm going to live with it. I can deal with it. But let's share. Let's share. But many people with disabilities feel isolated. They don't have friends. They know they're different. They're not accepted. They don't have the knowledge base. They're trying, but they're, they're boo-hooed and, and hoo-hooed every time they try. Lack of support seeks attention for approval. Many of our guys love one-on-one -on -one attention. Because we can manipulate that. And don't you think folks know this? They know how to do it. It's not hard. They have poor boundaries because they don't understand boundaries. If you've watched Johnny and Bob hump the beanbag from day one, there are no boundaries. You don't understand what it is to call someone a special someone. There are four requirements for a friend. There's three for an acquaintance. But we're talking about values when we're talking honesty and respect and all of that. And we don't even have the basics now. Our name, phone number, address, likes and dislikes. All I have to do is ask you if you have a girlfriend or boyfriend. You say no, I say I am. You say okay, okay, we're done. Bingo, bingo. It's that simple. Forget that relationship development thing. That's just hogwash. You just do it like that because that's what you see on TV too. But you don't understand reality and fantasy. Tanya, what was the show that you really enjoyed watching that we had a couple of discussions on? Seven Heaven. Seven Heaven. Anybody heard of it? Okay, what was it about that show that you could relate to? And in that hour show with 10 minutes of commercial break or whatever it was, you had a plot of something happened, and by the end, everybody's singing Kumbaya and a happy camper with it. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, in my life, things do not totally turn around within that hour, what, 50 minutes, really, come on, you know, with the soap set commercial. Um, and everything comes out rosy. Maybe your life it does, but in mine, in crisis land, not so much. But Tanya really felt that that was real. And there could be some real moments in there, but the timeline was wrong. And it doesn't always happen that everybody's happy at the end. And some of the things that we had to go over is that all of those people are actors. They are paid to act like that. That is their job. Not real, that's their job. And that the writers are paid to write this and to make sure that everybody's happy at the end. Unless it's, you know, continued with episode number two. And then it's resolved. It doesn't go on for a lifetime. If there's a crisis, it, it's over within two, two shows. But that's not the way it is in real life. The time when I talk about this for a while. And why don't you so well? So, we talked about the S game. We already played that. So, what you don't know, for those of you who are 
are investigating abuse. These are things you have to understand before you just put out a forensic interview or before you just start discussing. You don't understand what their educational level is. I don't mean whether or not they went through first grade through 12th grade and, and now they got their PhD. I don't care about that. I have people with PhDs. I have people with, with first grade education and below. I don't care about your educate what you have on the wall. I'm looking for something meaningful. I need to know what educational level, I need to know what educational level you are in regards to social sexual education. Where'd you learn it? How do you learn it? What do you know? What don't you know? Another thing with people with disabilities, especially mild or borderline, and those of you who work with this population will, will agree with me, I hope. Tanya, what is the thing that pisses me off about you guys? Generally. Yeah, we love specialized disability. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The hardest group I work with are mild, but borderline. Because they do things they know how to hide. They know how to mimic. When I mention something and I say something, I look at the audience and you're nodding your heads, you're doing like this, and they learn how to do it too. Or they take cues and I tell a joke and someone starts laughing and, <laughs> and they don't have a clue what I'm talking about. And I know that. But I'm looking at it like you're pissing me off. Because you're agreeing with me and I know you don't know diddly squat. But you're afraid to ask questions. And why are you afraid to ask questions, Tanya? Because you are afraid to ask that people will really know the real one. And if they know the real ones, they will turn us away and say, we don't want to be near you. You're the white They don't want to be called stupid. They should know this stuff. They know they're supposed to know this stuff. And they don't want to be called stupid and retard and all of that. Because they don't realize that we ask questions too. But they don't see that because we're all knowing. And we don't think out loud. Or we go off to our groups and ask questions or we go to these conferences, but by the time we see them, they think we know it all. And so they hide, they know how to hide and we think they understand this stuff. And they don't. I'm gonna tell you how to fix that. They know how to nail it. Okay, they want to please you. They want you to like them. So they give you the answer that you want to hear. Whether it's true or not, they don't care. They just want you to be okay and they don't want you to not accept them. So they want to please you. Fantasy versus reality, we talked about it. Timeline. My guys don't understand time. If I say it happened a long time ago, that could have been before breakfast. That could have been an hour ago. It could have been 20 years ago. They don't understand that. This becomes problematic when you're asking questions about especially abuse or, or when did this happen? Can't always tell by what they say. Not all of them understand, male and female. I've had girls and guys who tell me they're girls and guys and I'm not talking transgender, I'm not talking all that. I'm talking, they just don't know. They don't know. They don't know ages, adult versus child. They don't understand puberty. They don't understand how that works. And so we're asking these things about their age and this and that, and they don't have a clue. Or they've been told, well, they're a child in, in, in an adult body, so they're, they're really about four or five. And so they identify with four and five, and that's what they think. They don't know. So the thing to combat all of that the one that nails my guys left and right, but I love doing is I say, show me. Don't tell me. I know you can regurgitate. I knew Tanya when I was asking her all my questions and she aced my test. And I'm like, that is not the person I heard about on the phone who's been raped seven times, abused, and she's trying to, you know, take her life. This is not the person sitting across from me. 
and she is pissing me off. And I only met her twice. And she was just making me angry. So I went around the big desk and said, show me. And I knew when she could not show me or say no, and I was on top of this girl, that she didn't have a clue. Show me your personal space. And I asked my sweet Sarah. I like the best toy. It's all over. Show me how you say no, no. You say no, 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 no. No. So I grab something from her. Show me. Don't tell me. As I already know, you're going to hide. You're going to lie to me. Because you've learned how to do this. And you do it well so that we like you. Well, I don't. You're pissing me off. Because I need you to understand this. Not please me. Because that's pretty hard to do. Okay. So I do it with pictures. Forget the words. Give me pictures. What's okay? What's not okay? What's against the law? And I need those pictures to look bad. I need exaggerated faces. Why? Because I'm teaching body language. My students have a hard time reading those faces and understanding. So I do visuals. So in this picture, I can ask, what's going on here? And where can you do what there? I don't need to talk about it. Show me. Take my dolls and show me. Now I know what you know. Not what you can regurgitate, the fancy word for throwing up, because nurses make these things up. Regurgitation is what my students do. They memorize what they're supposed to say, and they say it. That's all I think about every time they're just saying these therapy words. I'm like, Bleh. You say that. Bleh. Inappropriate. Bleh. I'm like, what the hell is that? What's inappropriate touching? This could be inappropriate touching. That's a lot different than this. Tell me what the heck it is. And then we can work on it. But I don't know what it is when I see these words. But we're afraid to write those words. He's grabbing, she's doing this, they're doing that. I need to know specifics. And the best phone call I get is when I get agency, service coordinator, social workers, whoever, and they said, well, we're referring them to you because they're doing some inappropriate blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, good, one of those. <laughs> what did you do? Well, you know, this school they're, they're reporting some inappropriateness at recess. Oh, good. I was inappropriate at recess. What, what, what does that mean? Eventually, squirming and worming, I get out what is happening. I said, give me a visual of this. I need to see it in my head. Tell me what is happening so I can assist them. Because I can't assist if I don't know exactly what's going on. I knew with Susan and the two cars, it wasn't the colors of the cars that was causing her to get hit. But I didn't know till I started talking to her to realize that the red one and the green ones were the ones that are on the attack mode. But I knew that wasn't real. Oh, <laughs> Molly's doing this. Common hurdles with our guys. Echolalia. Yeah? Obsessing. Big issue in the autism world. OCD. Obsess, obsess. By God. Real versus fantasy. That's all the generic disabilities in developmental world. I'm not talking blind and deaf and all that. Visual disturbances. They don't see everything. And I want you to put your finger, your, do a pinhole. Okay, and then look at this up here, this 
screen. And what do you see? You see Galanel a pinhole. That's not a pinhole. <laughs> Thank you. You can't go this big and say, oh, I should see it. So a pinhole. That's exactly how people with autism look at things. It's in a pinhole. They look at the detail. Do not try to challenge them in finding Waldo. They find the damn Waldo gun <laughs> every time. It pisses me off. They're so damn good because we're looking at the whole picture and saying, oh, Waldo's at the beach or Waldo's at the park. They don't see that. They zoom in on every inch and they don't see the whole picture until they go through every inch of that damn picture. They find Waldo. Their detail. They do the detail, they don't do the big picture. They obsess on the detail. When I talked about um, body parts and, and sexual obsession stuff, this is where people think with foot fetishes or armpits or elbows, people with autism get hooked on the five senses. That's part of their issues. Sight, touch, smell, Taste, hearing. Most people with autism have two or three hypersensitive type of, of, um, uh, what am I thinking of? Um, what is the word? Thank you, Sam. I know this. Um, they have two or three hypersensitive. So it could be sight, it could be hearing, it could be taste. They all have touch issues. Yes. Where's this here? I'm screaming at you right now. The pain of us watching TV with her because the volume is like a screen. And you know, it's right at that volume level where you can hear every once in a while, but you can't hear and it gets irritating. <laughs> Hello, that's me, irritated. And of course, I need to put it to a level that I can hear. And of course, that's blasting to her. All right, so our guys have, at least in the autism world, have hypersensitivity in usually two or three of the senses, and it's different for each one of them, so you can't just say it's always me. All right, so part of their problem is the visual distortion. They don't see the whole picture. They're looking for a pinhole, and uh, the first time I met, I had a class and I had someone with autism in it. I showed a picture of a slide of somebody looking at someone in the shower. And the someone in the shower is going, Woo! and the guy's going, Woo! you know, and he's got his hand in his hand. Ah, okay. So it was great. I mean, over exaggerated plus, but it was great. So I asked my audience always, so what's, what's going on in this picture? So I asked Bob, Bob, what's going on? They have zest soap. So I'm looking at the picture and I go, well, let me check that out, Bob. And my, there it is, zest soap. This bit, you zoom in there, a zest soap. The whole picture, look. So, and he's going to get on the soap. And of course, a fellow student's like, you're right, huh? And I'm like, no, 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 we're not going on the show because we digress. You know, I cleaned the desk soap this morning. Well, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I cleaned my shower tonight. I'm like, I don't care. So I put the kids to the picture. It took us 20 minutes to understand what that picture was about because we had to go through the towels. The picture on the wall, the toilet, all the crap to get to that picture. Now, had that been a movie and he zoomed through, do you think he would have gotten that? What the general picture was about? And the answer was no. But one still photograph, I can get through. Oh, I have a tree like that. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. I'm like, okay, great. Right. But then I can zoom in on what it is, and it's a public place. We don't masturbate out there. We don't strip, and we don't pee on the tree. No. So you have to understand if they have visual disturbances, 
Or if they can't see because they don't wear their glasses, because they don't want to wear the glasses because they're that thick, and they, they can't see and they're too far back and they really need to be up here on the screen. You don't know. Speech distortions. Our guys have speech distortions. That's just general. Down syndrome, half thick and tongue, just general, general stuff. The different syndromes have different problems with speech. Most of them have speech delays and speech difficulties. And they're in speech therapy from early on. And some people can pick up on the speech and others have trouble. I've had about three people in my lifetime that I cannot understand. And now I, and I'm like, and I get so impatient with myself and I say, you know what? I'm so sorry. I am having difficulty in understanding. It's my, it's my problem. It's not your problem. You're saying something. I, I'm not hearing it. I'm not, I'm, I'm not processing it correctly. Is there someone that can help us with this? I'm like, okay. Is that a yes or a no? And then we can do the sign on. Okay, great. Give me that person. And they will bring me that person. Usually it's a friend. And they will, they, then the friend, they'll say something, and the friend will say this and that. And, and, and they're like, okay, I'm getting this. I'm getting this. And I'm showing pictures, and I'm asking yes and no. And I'm saying, put these together and show me this and show me that. By the time we're done, I don't have to understand everything they're saying because we're into the show me mode. And yet, if I'm not clear on something, I'm, I'm sitting there with a friend and then verifying that with a yes or a no. But it's my issue. But I don't say, I don't try to pretend like I know what they're saying. And I don't. And I'm going to say, you know, my ears are acting up. I can't understand them. And that's okay to do. Because we're not all perfect. And I admit that to my students. I show them the way I draw them. I go, oh, my dad, I have these little stick figures. And I draw big boobs on one and a penis on the other. I said, there's your guy and girl. There we go. So that's why I have dogs. That's why I hired some of my students to do graphic art. Because they can do it. I can. Memory distortions. This is not uncommon also. Flashbacks, especially with abuse. It's hard to wrestle that and understand all of that, especially if you haven't talked to someone about it. Most cases of abuse do not become notified to authorities. Most residential, most group homes, most places do internal investigations that never go over well. As mandated reporters, we are to report. We are not judge and jury. We don't need to have evidence, but many people in this field feel that they need to do that and investigate. And that becomes a problem. Less than 1% of our people that report ever get convictions. Tanu was very lucky. She did report, she did get conviction. And she got a restraining order over another one. But we're talking sexual assault for seven times. The wrong people. Plus, investigators and, and police are not trained on how to do this correctly. You need stuff. Whenever I come out with an investigation, I'm like, I've stuck. Where's your stuff? Out of paper and pencil. And I said, well, I'll put your stuff here. Because now I'm going to show you how to do this and do it correctly. And then you're going to write notes on show me as opposed to who, what, when, where, why. Are not understood in my world. It's as simple as that.
So, if we want to continue with the victimization and the medical model, that's great, because if we are going to continue with vulnerability. Because if we protect people from understanding social sexual education, they're going to be victimized. If we protect them from decision making because I know it all and you don't and I'm going to keep you not knowing it all because I'm so much better than you, they're going to be victimized. If we protect them from society, all people are bad, strangers are bad, stranger danger. It's bull crap. Less than 1% of our guys get abused by strangers. What we should say is everybody else that you know, be scared of. Go <laughs> off with strangers. Do yourself a favor. But I don't see those bulletin boards. <laughs> protect them from relationship understanding. Well, you know, how many of us kiss the same person that we married or have a long-term relationship with? So how do those girls do to understand what they're looking for? And that's the whole issue. But we expect them to get it right the first time or not at all because we don't want them to go through that. Well, why? If we're demonstrating appropriate relationship and we have a loving partner, but we say, we can do it, but you can't, what is that saying to people? Ah, yeah. And you're going to come back and talk about your state. So, living with abuse, this is not uncommon for abuse victims of any of these. Typical of them, it doesn't matter. They have medical issues. Sonia had a lot of lower abdominal pain. She would use urban care a lot because she didn't understand. She needed just someone to talk to, and she didn't understand what it was. And so she would go in there all the time with, with, with pain. Dress, layers and layers of clothing, not uncommon. Suicide, not uncommon. Behavioral psychiatric issues, not uncommon for people who have been abused. Okay, now the fun part. There is hope. Yes, yes, it's not all bad news out there, people. It is, it is. It is good stuff. Now, I lied, I told you after lunch, it's after lunch, I just thought exactly good. It is getting better. Okay, we're going to talk about assertiveness training. We're going to talk about social skills training. All of those things re reduce abuse by about 60%. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Just by doing a few things. If you're going to leave here today, you only have to do And there we are. Okay, now we get to the resources. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to start the resource one, take a little bit of break, and then I'll look at this. Okay. Okay, so um, what we're going to do in the resource, I'm going to run through some of the power slides, and then we're going to get into groups. I'm going to get into a couple of different groups, and then we're going to swap groups. And let me tell you how the groups go. Um, for those of you who want to learn more about healthy relationships, social awareness, all that kind of stuff, and basic knowledge, whether it's with little twists, and that's anything under the age of about 18, um, to adults, this is the social program. Now, this stuff reduces abuse by around 65, 70%. It's just teaching relationship awareness, how close, what you should do, how you should do it. This program is based on three things. Three things. One, what that relationship is. What that looks like, a boyfriend, girlfriend, family, acquaintance, what that is. What does that mean in my world? And then, what are the activities common with that relationship group? And then the third component of each of these programs is, what are the touch boundaries? Because my kiss to mom and dad should be different than my kiss to my husband or boyfriend or significant other or whatever it is. It should be different. But how would you know if you just say, I kissed Uncle Bob? My hug should be different between family and my husband or significant partner. That should be different. Touching is different. But how would you know if you haven't been taught or been groomed from in to be inappropriate? So this program talks 
about this, and I'll share some of that. Okay. Oh, it's up. Five more. So, stumbling blocks. I love to talk about this because everybody gets anxious about this. I have interns that come in and work with me, and I and I love it when I get the counselor interns because they're always afraid to say the wrong thing. Or they say, aren't you afraid you're going to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing? And then it's going to affect their lives for the rest of their lives. I'm like, whoa, that's really heavy. Yeah, that doesn't bother me at all. Because I tell them up front, I make mistakes. But I'll tell you when I'm making a mistake, and that's the way it goes, and you're going to make mistakes. And we're going to learn together. I'm not so powerful that I have the ability to affect your life for the rest of your life, and I can do all. I'm not that good. I'm here to exchange information with you. That's all. I said, so I, I'm really just not that powerful. So, but it causes a lot of anxiety for people to talk about this stuff, and I understand it. Like I said at the beginning, I know a lot about this much. Everything else, I don't know about. But we have anxiety of learning. We have anxiety of a lack of awareness or not understanding, or not knowing how to teach to this population. So what we do at SEED is we create material for this population. I don't adapt it from somebody else's credit anymore. I'm done with that. People say, well, can't I use, you know, could we just kind of redo this and, and do it to middle school? I said, well, sure, you can do it and do it to middle school because I ain't doing it to you know, I already got my job cut out for me, and that is to work with people with disabilities. You want to adapt this stuff, go for it. But I'm not adapting anymore. I've already got the research. I've already got the information. I already know what to do and how to do it. I just need to have that time to do it. So we get a lot of anxiety about this. And then some people just you know, say, it's too much. I'm not going to do it. When I started creating this material, I lectured at the um, various agencies and, and uh, universities and stuff like that. And I was at this agency and I was babbling about whatever I did. And a young woman came up to me and said, I want to work with you. And I said, no, no, no. And she goes, no, 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 no. I've worked in park and rec. I've always worked with people with disabilities. I really like what you, what you talked about and I really want to do this. I said, oh, you're so cute. Go away. I said, you know, you really don't want to do this because I rip off rose-colored glasses. I'm not into the cutesy stuff. I'm into the hardcore stuff. And you really don't want to know what's underneath that person because they're not going to tell you they've been abused because then they're not going to like them. They're not going to tell you because they're afraid to lose their independence. They're not going to tell you these things. I ask those questions. I get the hardcore stuff and I deal with the hardcore stuff. You've done, you've done these other fun things, good. Go do them, it's fun, enjoy yourself. Stay away from me. Well, she was what I would call now a stalker. She would not leave me alone. So finally you have to get a little grump with these people and say, you know, what the hell? What are you gonna do for me? Forget you, I know what I can do for you. What are you gonna do for me? So she said, the one thing that gets to me every time, I can write. I said, what? <laughs> I can yell, but I can't write as well. I can edit like that, but I can't start it. And so I said to her, and you know, when you're in school and naive, it's, they're so cute. She said, well, I have the summer off. I said, off. Oh. I have been at this for 17 years. So I'll create all of this for you this summer. I said, Yay, you are so good. I said, Well, I tell you what, I'll make you do it. You stick with me and get all of this stuff out of my head and put it on paper. If it takes you a summer or a lifetime, I really don't care. Oh no, I have all summer off. Katie's been with me now for over 25 years. She now is a forensic psychologist in NASA. Katie Petrick. 
<laughs> she was my original. <laughs> She's a wonderful, wonderful woman. And you'll see her name on this stuff because she helped the beginning of the creation of this material. And now she's doing an amazing rant, which is awesome. And she sent me some of the stuff and showing me this. And it's right along with everything that we've done from the very get go. It is awesome. But this program talks about social awareness. And that is important because that takes care of most abuse. If you understand the boundaries, you understand the relationship, you understand everything, then abuse is less likely to occur. The other thing, the other thing that needs to happen is understanding sexuality. That week of sex ed that I had wearing pads for months and the egg, I'm still not sure about that chicken and egg thing. But whatever, boys, I did discover that boy after being married one and having one, yeah, they're bad. Anyway, still like them. The issue is. Here's sex ed. It's not a week. But here it's taught with the idea of what my students need to know. And remember, most of them are introduced to sexuality through abuse. I like to do the first five lessons, which talk about public, private, body awareness and whatnot. That's generally for most of, for everybody gets that. For middle school, later high school, depending on the person's educational abilities and whatever, that hardcore stuff comes in. There's two different, two different types of education in here. All of the material comes with workbooks and whatnot to show you what they know and what they really don't know. There's assessments pre and post so you know what they know and what they don't know. Because they can nod their heads, they can see you answers, but that doesn't mean they really know. So there's abuse, sexuality, all of that. And Tanya will talk about her Stay Safe book that she wrote regarding abuse awareness and how to help other people with disabilities. All of that goes together. All of these kinds of things deal with all of this. Because I'm looking to give people a healthy sexuality, a healthy self-concept, a healthy way to interact in their communities. So what's in your toolbox? If I was going to you and saying, I'm going to come build your house and I show up with one nail, one saw and one hammer, would you hire me? No, it takes a boatload of stuff to build a house. If you're going to work with this population and you're going to do all of the social sexual junk, it takes a boatload of junk to do it. I pack up my PR suitcase to take out to show. Depending on what I'm teaching and what I'm doing depends on what I'm bringing or pulling out to work with students with. Going away from my camera. <laughs> this right here is my camera. <laughs> my students need visual aids. So I have visual aids. This is part of the relationship awareness poster. It has colors, it has shapes, it has people. So that, that assists them in learning about these different groups by utilizing different areas of their brain to remember the information. Very important. For those of you working with younger ones, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever. Here's a box of print. There are three concepts in here. Public, private, good touch, bad touch, and feelings. You can play games like go fish to teach feeling skills, to teach understanding, war, uno, concentration.
Constitution. All of those games can be taught with these cards. And as a facilitator, I make up the rules all the time. I lie because I manipulate. I don't care. I'm here to teach you. Not to play by the rules. But there is one game that I don't have to cheat on. And that's concentration. My guys seem to have it memorized. Where the, you know, I never pay attention when you flip the card over and you see one face and you see another and they match and they don't match. They memorize that. So I never have to cheat on that one. But the other games, I cheat on. Why? Because I'm teaching a concept. I don't care, I don't keep score. They keep score. They tend to win most of the time. That's okay, I can handle that. As long as they learn the concept. Because that's what I'm into. So this teaches three things. If they know public and private, good touch, bad touch, and feeling, this reduces abuse. Right there. In a box. Plain old print. Activity book that goes with relationship awareness. You know, now people are into this adult coloring stuff. Oh, great. I, okay, yay. Here's things to color that go along with the lessons. And visual aids that they can put up. All the things, things you need to help decrease abuse. How do you talk about growing up if you don't have pictures? You have to have visuals. My guys learn with visual role modeling, role playing, manipulating things. And that's what you need. The body. How does it change? Where are the private parts? What are public parts? If someone comes by and touches you on the arm, they, they, they're not necessarily going to jail. But how would you know that? If you haven't been taught that. You can use pictures. You can use graphic arts. You can use black and white. Depending on the medium your students do best with. You have to assess to see what they do best with. For some of my students, this is way too much color. Way too much real. They need to go back to that. Most of our material starts around fourth grade level, the educational stuff. This stuff starts as early as, depending on three, four, five, depending on the, you know, kids' ability. And if they rip up a card or two, who cares? There's not 140 of them. Rip away. No. So okay, a red colors, relationship culture, we'll talk more about that. Self-book. Okay. Like I said, each of these books have a purpose. And with the self-book, you're talking about feelings, self-esteem, and personal boundaries. Those are the critical things. How many of you have heard of personal bubble, purple circle? Yeah. All of that is critical. But the number one problem with my guys, come on in, come and stand up and show you how this works. You have to be within camera too. Mm -hmm. So I asked my students, show me your personal bubble or space or purple circle, whatever. And you do what? Oh, and I say, okay, now stick your heads out all the way, all the way. So stick them out. Okay, this is great. Her personal space is this big. But then someone like me comes in and I come in. And then the personal bubble gets to be nothing. It's a limp noodle. So I tell them, you need to maintain that personal space. I want you to have a stick at your arm. And I do not want you to let me in your personal space. And then after a little time, they learn that personal space so that they can resist and keep me out. But that doesn't happen like that. So when they're talking about personal space and they're like, you know, it's over here, or some of them go like this, and I'm like, great! And then I come in and it gets to 
this photo. I'm like, no, that's not right. That's what I mean by show me. Don't tell me. Show me. The number one to counteract my cognitive disability. Family. A lot of my guys think, you know, again, I hear from parents, well, you know, I don't know, they're always nice to everybody else, but they're, you know, they, they get mad at me and all this. I'm like, well, welcome to parenthood. You know, it's, it's better that they're nice to everybody else and not to you. You know, that's what you, that's, that's typical teaching. But my guys also think, when I ask them, do you ever get mad at mom and dad? No. <laughs> no. I love mom and dad. Don't get mad. You very upset? No. Happy, yeah. Scared, no. Like, really? I get pissed off at my parents all the time. And I get sad, and I get this, and I get that. <laughs> Trust me, my mom gets pissed off at me now. <laughs> so, this is important that they understand the whole group of feelings, and it's okay. It's not that you are or not, it's what you do about it. And responsibility. Some of my students feel that they are enabled, and they are entitled. That mom and dad is their personal slave and everybody should do things for them because they have a disability. I'm like, well, I don't really give a rat's butt. Call it what you want, but I ain't. And I'm here to help you and you are here to help me. So we have an equal relationship, but I am not picking up after you and you don't have to pick up after me. But there are responsibilities. And part of family responsibility is teaching those skills, how to be independent how to do the things on your own unless you would make a gazillion dollars and you can hire everybody to do it for you. That's what responsibility is. Parenting is about teaching and helping your child grow up to be a productive member of society, whatever that productive member is. But not to sit there and ring a bell and expect everybody to serve you because you have a disability. Boundaries. But there are boundaries. When you kiss Uncle Bob or you kiss Mom or Dad or you don't want to kiss Mom and Dad, that's okay. But that kiss, yeah. Fred's friend. Yeah. Fred's oh, a little part. Oh, he's always losing his pants, too. I know. <laughs> this kissing is different. But they don't know. Yes, it's all different. My students get afraid of them. All right, friends. Friends versus others. There are four requirements for a friend. You know their name. They do things together on free time. Not in that forced classroom with a cupcake. Not, oh, you're in Johnny's group, so you have to do everything with Johnny. No, I don't. He's not my friend. I can eat lunch with somebody I want to. Just because he's in my group doesn't mean he's my friend. So you do things on free time. You know their name and number, and you care about each other. Oh, there goes that manipulation thing. You care about how each other feels, so you don't try to do something to harm your friend. Now, you might harm your friend by saying something or hurting their feelings, but typically a friend will say, I'm sorry, and mean it, and not keep doing it. That decreases that bullying. That caring part. But my students don't know that because they think if I just go up next to that person, we're friends. And if I ask you if you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, you say no, then we're in. It, it happens like that. Acquaintances. This is the toughest one. How do you take an acquaintance and maybe be a peer and become friends and become lovers? and then break up with them. Or another acquaintance who's my teacher and I have a crush on them and they start abusing me and I love them and they love me and then they end up in jail. Well, what's the difference? They're all acquaintances. Or then there's the community helpers, like bus driver and the person you see at 7-Eleven every time you go up to fill up your whatever. Or the bank, or the this, or the that. What are the differences there? This helps explain it. And the boundaries for acquaintances. 
And then strangers. Who stranger, stranger? Eh, we don't teach that. We teach strangers are people we just don't know. And there's good strangers and bad strangers, and you can't tell by their face. It's by their hearing. They're listening. They're processing. If you tell a stranger that you're in their space or they're bothering you, if you're a good stranger, they'll say, oh, excuse me, and, and move away. Or if they bump into you or you bump into them, you're supposed to say, excuse me. This whole, we don't talk to strangers, they don't talk to bull crap. If we don't, then we're being rude if we bump into someone and we just totally ignore them. But then we teach our, our students, don't talk to strangers, but then we're talking to them. I'm standing in a long line at Costco or wherever. I'm like, oh, dude. And I'll strike up a conversation with somebody. That is not uncommon. But I'm sure not asking them about their sex life. I'm not asking for their personal information. I'm just talking general talk, general public talk. What is that? Ooh. That's what we should be teaching our guys. Courtesy. You bump into someone, you say, you know, excuse me. That's talking. General talk. If I'm in a line, long line, or it's hot, and I'm like, you know, oh, it's hot. And they're like, oh, it's hot. Yeah, it's really hot. Oh, you know, you know, where are some places I'm new here? So I'll ask the stranger, where are some places that I could go to eat? Or where's this? Or where's that? I'm not asking them to come back with me. It's general public information. We need to be talking about public, personal, and private information and what the differences are and who should we be telling what to. Not just don't talk to these people. That doesn't make sense to me. So, public and private. And the most important, move. get loud and move towards the crowd. Someone's harassing you and bugging you, get loud. People are running. What's going on? Turks don't like loud, obnoxious people. They really don't. They like quiet, mouthy people. Tanya, have you ever been sexually abused, molested since? No. Now, at the Padres, this is a this is a Padre fan, a baseball team. You know what I'm saying? It's a farm team. It's a farm team. Well, I know. It's all the all the San Diego sports thing. <laughs> so her family will go, and you know, at some of these games, if any of you are baseball people, my whole family is. I did not get that team. They look at me like, you know, you are such a weirdo because I do not care about any of that stuff. And so you know how you know they get you and they make you do this waving and you know, yeah, waving. What the heck are you doing? And you wave and you're standing up and you're yelping and I'm like, you know, what the heck? Okay, have you seen different parts of that? Does anybody use sports or see any of this kind of stuff? Okay, all right. So they get loud and you do cheers and you do all this, this obnoxious stuff. Okay, well, Tanya's family being the, the wonderful people they are that really belong in a library and never say, and they just can't stand me when I come in because I make enough noise for 10 people. And they bring Tanya to these things now. And what is Tanya doing? What are you doing now? I'm praying away. <laughs> Along with 99% of the crowd out there. And that's okay. And that's okay. We need to get loud. We need to teach our guys to get loud. Not just say no. That doesn't matter. But how you say it. And mean it. And not to stranger danger, but to the people they know. And I'll show you how I do that, starting with the cards, for those who play the cards. Activity, we talked about that, role play games, coloring, all of those activities. And then Tanya's book. Talk about your book there, lady. You probably want the microphone. I've got this one. I'll get your other ones out. <coughs> Is it working? Yeah. 
I will just sit because um, when uh, we were finished with uh, the training and all, um, Stacy asked what I wanted to do, and I said, I want to make sure no one was is there, like I have been hurt in the past. So we uh, came up with all of my different stories, although we changed the sex and the gender since this book. But they're all my stories, but <laughs> we use this book for, and my regional center has used it, and some teachers have used it. That's parents use it? Um, I don't know about generally parents, but therapists have used therapists, it a lot. Yeah. Um, and it's to teach how to say no, how to bring up the stories of abuse. And it starts off with bullying and, and simple stuff um, and being called names to emotional, uh, physical, and, and then sexual. It's all kinds of things. It's not just hardcore stuff. It, 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 it's all abuse stuff, but it's learning how to say no. And so we'll pass that around and have, have it, you guys have a chance to, to see how it is utilized and interacts with students. It's usually good for small groups of one on one or one and two or three, no more than that, generally speaking. Um, so that's why therapists, and we use the visuals again to help understand what we're talking about and how to say no, not no, but no. And they have to practice this and work on this until they feel confident they are capable of doing this. Even students, and that's what this is not great really how that is. So um yeah Tanya one of the things I say is is when I got I met Tanya Tanya was working and um had a paid job and what were you doing? Baby service working as janitorial in the restroom area. Restroom or stocking the shelves. And those are typical jobs for our guys. Landscaping, janitorial, trash abatement, uh, stocking, uh, not stocking, stocking, but stocking <laughs> shelves. <laughs> and cleaning those kinds of things, those are our typical jobs. And those are sought after jobs. When I met Tanya and we worked for two and a half years, she had had that job and she was working and I had told her at one point when we were done, I said, I'm done, I can't do anything else. I, I, I can't teach you anything, you go off and take over my job, that's fine with me. And I said, but if ever you want a job, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. I'm going to create a job for you, but I don't know what that is right now. But if ever you want to change, give me a call. Six months later, Tanya called and said, do you remember me? No, I don't remember you at all. Yes, for some reason I do remember you. And she said, I'd like to work with you. And I said, okay, come on in. And the thing that she said was, I want to help other people. And I said, well, you know what? That's kind of sort of what I want to do too. Maybe we should team up and, and help each other help other people. And that was the beginning of her creating this book. That was also the beginning of her consulting with us of what we should use, what we shouldn't use, brought in her friends, brought in other people to help us survey our material to tell us what works and what doesn't. Collaborative effort here, people. Yes. What age did you say for the book? The book? Yeah. Um, for your her book, it. I I think the book 
focus is pretty much elementary on up because it starts with verbal bullying. And so I would say somewhere around in there is pretty much what people have used it for. Not usually grade school and that kind of stuff. But somewhere between like first, second, third grade on up through adulthood. And it just brings up, and you don't do all the stories at once because you know it's a little much. Um, but you know, you pick and choose, and you you can see and look at the book and decide, you know, how how to bring it up and when and where. For high schools and transition programs and stuff, this material is the most critical because it teaches relationship awareness. It teaches the foundation of everything. Over here, the abuse stuff, very good to understand regarding abuse investigations and what's important and what's not. And then the sexuality stuff is sexuality. Critical for all, some of it is geared towards, you know, when I was teaching my son and daughter at, at two about bodies or private and whatever, whatever, to oral sex, anal sex, that didn't come at two. But all of those things happen. There's like two levels to this book. The first level is understanding public and private, understanding your body, understanding what's okay, what's not okay. That's, that's just general stuff that everybody should know. But then it goes into puberty. It goes into masturbation. It goes into other areas. And all of that becomes critical too to understand before abuse occurs. So what I think we're going to do is, yeah, they just a break at 2.20. Thank you, because that's what I was going to do. So put them on break. Tell them. They got a break. They'll have a break. Break. When you get back, we'll take the group.